Sorry. All right, we're going to get started at 7.01. So we're going to call the November 7th Monday meeting to order of the Waterbury Select Board. And Danny, Vice Chair, unfortunately, Mike, our chair, couldn't be here with us tonight. So I'll be uh, doing my best to run our meeting. And um, we'll get started with approving the agenda. I'll take a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Motion and seconds for the discussion. Yes, I would propose two adjustments. Can we take the um, acknowledgement of the Verizon Wireless off of the consent agenda? Um, and we'll have that as the first select board item and then add um, a review of our ARPA input process at the end of select board items. Should I add one other thing? Mm -hmm. Brief discussion about uh, Boulder Gravel Pit. Yes, should we put that at the end of the select board items? Okay. Before our board or after? Um, um, short, sorry. like less than five minutes. Yeah. FYI information. Okay. Let's put it before. So that'll be G and ARP will be H. Will that work? Okay. So we've moved the cell tower uh, from consent to the top of select board items. We've added the Bolton gravel um, to G and then added ARPA input survey conversation to H. Any other amendments? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, we to approve agenda as amended. Do we I, <laughs> I didn't know if we needed a new motion. I'm so sorry, Dean. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Excellent. Agenda has been approved as amended. Next is a motion to approve the consent agenda items A and B. I move to approve the consent agenda. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda passes. So we'll move on and give an opportunity for the public to speak, whether on Zoom or in the room. And this is an opportunity to talk about something that is not on the agenda. You will have an opportunity to speak to agenda items later. So is anybody in Zoom or in the room like to speak at this time? What was that? So two items just in public comment. Um, I wanted to give um, a public thank you and acknowledgement to everyone who came out um, to the open house for Bill and Carla and their retirement, and also give a special public shout out to Ingrid Shepelek for her incredible uh, behind the scenes organizing and coordination. I think anyone who was attended was really blown away and just want to acknowledge all the work that went into that. Um, and the second and truly public service announcements for the Venn diagram of folks who are here but have not voted, for those who are not aware, tomorrow is election day. The polls in Waterbury are open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Our polling location is Brookside Primary School on Stowe Street. If you have not um, returned your ballot and have your unvoted ballot, bring it with you. If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, please park in the back <laughs> and avoid 7.30 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. if you can because school is in session. But most importantly, I hope everyone votes if they have enough. Thank you. Anyone else for public? Thank you. Seeing none, we'll move forward to item A on the select board items, which is the acknowledging the receipt of an offer, uh, receipt of a Verizon wireless proposed application for a temporary 80 foot tower to provide cell service. And we moved this item to have a little discussion about the history and what's happening currently. Okay, um, I sent to the select board, I believe, uh, the application packet that the attorney firm of the MSK uh, sent. Uh, this is their application for a certificate of public good to build a temporary power uh, at the state complex. I did hear from Tom this afternoon that someone asked the question, you know, um, the town opposed the tower a few years ago, how come this is just on a consent agenda? The, the select board in the town did not oppose 
cell towers in Waterford. They opposed the installation of a cell tower on North Hill in Waterbury, which was a critical wildlife habitat, um, part of the Sheetsville Hill corridor and the corridor that uh, wildlife uses to move from basically west to east um, into, New, into New York State and into to New Hampshire. And there was uh, significant bear habitat there and the select board, uh, along with a number of private citizens, and to a lesser degree, the town of Stowe, all objected to the siting of the tower there. Uh, and we actually uh, won at the Public Service Commission, uh, Public Utility Commission. Um, we spent a lot of money on that, um, on that project uh, to, to oppose it. Uh, but it wasn't because we opposed cell towers. In fact, we made it plain then that there's a need for cell towers. And uh, we understood that opposing that particular one might have caused some problems with service for a time. <laughs> um, there are a couple of other projects in the works that I am aware of. One, I believe, is on Great Hill. Uh, that would be, uh, and I don't think it has come up before the Public Utility Commission yet. This particular tower at the state complex, and there's a map on what I sent out, um, it's going to be down off of uh, State Drive um, near the Department of Public Safety and the power plant. And um, I'll just read to you just a short portion of the description. Due to issues affecting the state police's use of the Verizon network in the waterway, uh, Verizon is deploying a short-term cell on wheels portable site at this location. For a longer term, until a permanent solution can be found, Verizon must erect a temporary ballast tower to ensure that service in this area is not interrupted. And they expect this tower to be in place for two years. Um, it's 80 -ish feet high, I believe. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's in an area that has some uh, buildings that are fairly tall and there's trees around. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to see it, um, but to be able to see it means that signals can get out from it. Um, so I put it on the consent agenda simply to, um, you know, they're required by law to um, inform the legislative body of the town that's going in, uh, the planning commission, and and other um, other um, impacted parties. Uh, it appeared to me that this was not something uh, that would be of concern to the board. Uh, I think we should simply acknowledge that we've received it. I mean, unless you have very different concerns than I do, I don't see if there's any issue here. Since it's moved from consent agenda, do we need to make any motion or official action? Yeah, you do, because right. you've taken it off consent mm -hmm. agenda. Um, I, I would say just to let everyone know, to remind everybody, and maybe some of the select board members as well, um, communications facilities like this do not uh, need local permits. They're not subject to local zoning regulations. Uh, we oppose the one on North Hill because our town plan specifically cited that particular wildlife corridor and suggested that that was not a good place for this kind of facility. But uh, this is all dealt with at the uh, Public Utility Commission. So there's no zoning application that will be filed here. The, the DRB will have no uh, role in, in the siting of this. All of those issues with regard to aesthetics and, and impact uh, would be handled at the Public Utility Commission if people choose to go there. So just to... Yeah. I move that we uh, acknowledge uh, without objection uh, the uh, proposed uh, Verizon wireless, wireless uh, application. 
For a motion, do we have a second? Sure. Any further discussion? Uh, those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thanks for that. Stick Shelley. it next to the old chimney down there. The only one. <laughs> <laughs> Inside? Yeah, I, I, I thought the same thing, Chris. I thought they could just put the transmitter on top of the tower and save themselves. Uh, the construction of the tower, but probably that historic structure that that chimney is wouldn't be allowed to have something else yeah, on it. Sure. So in one of their comments, at least we're getting something constructed out of that complex. Um, before we move forward, I uh, am remiss that I missed something very important. There's another face at the table this evening, and it's uh, Tom, who is our newly hired um, municipal manager. He is currently acting as deputy manager while Bill is still here and transitioning. Um, but this is your first official meeting here with the select board. So I'm so sorry I let that pass by, but we're very, very glad you're here. And that's who we have to go with us today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, we are going to move forward to housing task force appointment. So we have put out to the public um, an invitation for citizens to join our newly forming a housing task force for Waterbury. And we got, um, I think a dozen or so um, interested folks. So the select board has had a little bit of time to review those because we don't have yet, <clears throat> but we will in the near future time, we knock on your door, um, an actual application or specific criteria for, for appointing. Um, the conversation will be a little bit loose, but I think what we're looking at is approximately six out of the 11 or 12 um, to round out the committee, knowing that anyone who is not um, technically appointed is still welcome and encouraged to attend those meetings as their public meetings, seeking input from um, citizens of Waterbury. So that said, um, Melissa, do you mind if I toss you in the stardust or how would you? So can I? Yeah, I please. This is something. Yeah. So you said, you said something about looking for six out of 11. So where's the other five? We had 11, I think it was 11 or 12 applicants. Oh, you so we're gonna five. appoint. Mm -hmm. And you're appointing six? Yes. Okay. That's okay. the goal, awesome. but. I thought you were appointing 12 and you had five already. Oh so no, five. opposite. So <laughs> <past me. laughs> right. Yeah, other way Sorry. around. That's okay, thank you for clarifying. Um, so honestly, I'm not sure how to structure the conversation. I had asked folks to maybe think of their top handful, three to six, um, and we can either start with that list or... So I'm just refreshing my memory mm -hmm. whenever I read something if it's... Too many days ago? <laughs> uh, you get 10 here? 10. Oh, I did right add now. one. So there's a follow-up email to that email. Okay. So there's one additional. So I think it is 11. I guess I would say just to ground us. So this was the idea of housing task force has floated around. We had a lot of nebulous discussions. Ironically, I will say, we said, oh, it might be too big. Let's keep it a manageable size. So we said with the four kind of set seats being a select board, EFA planning commission. Um, um, RW. Um, that that would be six members of the public as the, as the ballot. So again, I would just say like, one, I just want to acknowledge that getting 11 folks is really awesome. We have a later appointment in commission for a border commission with vacancies, which is more common. So I would say we haven't often had to whittle down the group mm -hmm. quite as much and just reemphasize what you said around, in my view, this would be a group to coordinate with initially, but would welcome kind of broader input. Mm -hmm. Um, and some of the other criteria we talked about was just diversity of perspectives, professional expertise. Um, so in considering folks, that was some of my lens. I genuinely don't know where to go next. Uh, I mean, I can just I list, yeah. Um, a couple of applicants are in the low income housing or affordable housing industry mm -hmm. to me that red flag came up to say you know possible conflict of interest uh, i don't know how you guys feel about that or whether it's something that we need to even consider um 
Eso, vamos a ver si lo tengo. Pues. Somebody that's a couple of things. Somebody that's, you know, it's not very often we get even this many people mm -hmm. applying for something like this. Um, be nice to see some new faces uh, in the town, perhaps. And if you don't think conflict of interest is an issue here, as far as and I and I respect their expertise in those areas. Well, that's just the first thing that came up when I read through the resume. I guess if that's what you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Sorry, I was just looking um, to see the jobs. I guess, so I'm just referencing the document we looked at. Mm -hmm. So just to say, we said the purpose of the Waterbury Area Housing Task Force is to advance the goals in the Waterbury Municipal Plan pertaining to housing and to engage in other areas of work related to housing as agreed upon by the group. The two goals from the Municipal Plan are to ensure the availability of safe, decent, and affordable housing for all current and future Waterbury residents and two, create housing in locations that maintain the integrity of neighborhoods while increasing density, respecting the natural environment, and minimizing the need for infrastructure improvements. That's just background to be clear. I'm not responding to your question yet. I guess um, I personally shape a little bit at the at red flags. I guess my personal view is we want a diversity of experiences. So I certainly wouldn't want a commission only focused on affordable housing, and I wouldn't want a commission only focused on market rate or high-end luxury housing. I think our goal is safe, decent, and affordable housing for all current and future Waterbury residents, which is gonna look like a lot of different types of housing for a lot of different types of people. Um, in terms of qualifications, you know, we had folks speak to a lot of backgrounds. We have, you know, an architect, we do have a couple of attorneys, and I know some of them did mention low-income tax credits, as well as someone who's on the board of Downstreet Housing and Community Development. Um, to me, I think their membership and professional perspective could be valuable in terms of living, eating, sleeping, breathing. In the same way, when we talk about roads, you say, well, yeah, I drive a truck and this is what it's actually like, and have you seen the cost of diesel? In a way, I don't. Um, that's just speaking to my personal view. I think in terms of conflict of interest, that would be something the commission would navigate in a group if there was to be a scenario. As of now, this is really an advisory group working to further the goals of the plan. They don't have a budget. They don't have legislative authority. Ultimately, that type of thing would come back to the select board or municipal staff. You know, I don't think this group can't on its own go or do things. I will say I serve on a separate board with someone. Um, so I, as a select board member, have to make a note to disclose and say, hi, we're talking about property in Waterbury. I'm on the select board and we have a process to go through. Um, so if there was to be some sort of public statement, I think that's something we can navigate. I acknowledge we're balancing that on another committee right now. And candidly, it's a draft. Um, <laughs> but you know, in my view, I think there are benefits to folks who are working in this field, potentially being part, not being an entire commission, but in my view, bringing that background and expertise could be valuable. That's my view in this context based on what we asked one. Um, and please, can someone, if there's waiting room, uh, feel yeah. free to poke me uh, or yell at me because I'm trying to do a couple things. Mm -hmm. um, I agree, and I think if it was, I think because it's a it's a larger group, it's a group of six. Um, we obviously, like we said, want a diversity in perspective and profession. So we want to make sure that group has a diverse representation. I think we can do that, Chris. So um, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, do you have input or question? Yeah, I mean, I think on a board like this, it does help to have a diversity of, of different of different professional perspectives. Uh, so if you have somebody who has uh, a law background in law, uh, someone background in finance, uh, perhaps construction, 
um, and uh, perhaps uh, a renter um, uh, mm -hmm. is approaching it from uh, a user perspective. Uh, so if we have you know those four or five different viewpoints represented, I think we've got a good shot at diversity and, and getting uh, you know, some good professional opinions uh, voiced uh, within the, the task force. Thank you. With I mean, you got 11, so you're looking for six. That's mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> um, I'm looking I'm, at we could put them up stable at that. Sorry, go on. A proposal we, we could move by person. Until we hit six, but that's imperfect. Um, I guess so. We can do it you, that way. You had one gal there, it was from Morgan, kind of, right? And she asked a question because she was from Morgan, does that exclude her? Um, I don't have that answer. I don't either. I think because we have a large um, because we have large interest and folks that do rent and own in Waterbury, I'm inclined to um, not appoint her in that group, but encourage her to be a part of the conversation and come to me. I mean, they're open meetings and she can still come to them. Um, does anyone agree or disagree? Well, she didn't put any of her, you know. Yeah, there wasn't uh, like a real big background. background. Yeah. That's tough to say, yeah. So Alyssa, you can you can have your own watery version of ranked choice voting and just <laughs> each of you write on a piece of paper one to one to eleven if you want, and then see which ones all the you can use an Excel sheet though. Here we go. But we have to do this. I here honestly think now. it's right. the most effective unless yeah. folks want to do it later. I'm I'm open to do it. I know we have scheduled yes. items on the agenda. We didn't have an appropriate mechanism for that. We can get this done tonight. Um, yeah. So do you want to do it now? Does everyone want to sure. rank? Yeah. And I'll start a spreadsheet. Nice. Um, okay. One for high. Are we golfing? Low score. Low score is what you want. First is the winner. Yes. Oh, yeah. One for high. Eleven for bottom. All right, so select like board members will all rank that. Uh -huh. And then you can use the chat like, and I'll have it here. <laughs> and then we can. And this is my them. pitch for we really need a process and criteria for these activities. No, this works well. But this is going, yeah, yeah. So, this could yeah. be it. Um, and <laughs> acknowledge we don't. It's nice, but it will be uh, right. Um, We're four out of five of them. This will probably be. The fastest. Tom yeah. did remind me that we can go into the deliberative session. You can. Oh, session. we, sh Alyssa had looked and thought we couldn't. Oh, thank God. <laughs> evaluation of the appointment or evaluation of the. But you have to make your choice. You, you'd have to announce it. Well, that's well, of course, fine. you don't have to either way. Um, let's try this first. Okay. Useful tool so we're voting and then... for our top six. Is that right? But rank out. Right Do one through one eleven. Through one through yeah. eleven. Yeah. And then. <laughs> I feel like I'm in school. I think that's one. Yeah, let me do something else. That's not great. It should be at the end of the same thread. Did you get it? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, I really want to mess with the chat. But you know what? Oh, that's yours, honey. She says important to us now. Oh, yeah, come on. We are underestimating that. She excels. I love her. She Um, okay. Do we need to one? do this? Yeah. Is this an order? This, this is my order. This is. <laughs> and then what are we doing with the rest of this, Chris? Uh, I'm mean, sorry, Roger. Roger. Wow. Sorry. Just, mm -hmm. just, I would say don't, don't just put them in and then we'll go from there. Okay. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it might not matter. No. I don't know. We love that. Yes, I made my turn. I'm going to go to the list. I'm going to ask you 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 Oh, I was born, we asked to do one of the family. I don't I don't know. I don't I do I don't know. I don't know. I don't I all right. Oh, no, I need Oh, <laughs> we're really we're doing our best. We're doing our best. That's our motto. We're just doing our best. Somebody else can step in. I mean, it's been months. Yeah, it's been months. 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 If you look at all the car dealerships, you don't put it Chris, did you write yours? Did you know? uh, it's one of the other uh, ones. Uh, 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 oh, I was a man. These days, you know, the difficulty in the All right, just getting back. Chris, did you write yours down? I want to get it. Or all eleven. No, take them five years old and turn it into a thirty year note. We root the mortgage and turn it into a forty year old. So we're going to go on live school for that. This is yours. I'm not sure. So it's now that's the thought. Do they say there the new? I mean, we just make it see people are living longer than us. So, is there a question of the bus? No, the 40s and the 60s, or however. Okay. 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 We're doing that. We're getting there. It's great. <laughs> Was this harder than um, the 10 questions about how well do you know them? <laughs> no, that was harder. <laughs> Alyssa got four. I got two. Um, one of which I got on the trap. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, the cars. Did it know that you could help me? 
for a hockey player? And I got yeah. a little off. Okay. Okay. Let me do my. It was worse than that. Awesome. It was worse than picking the Roman Powerball the first. Yeah. <laughs> Just as rewarding, too. Yeah, right. Great <laughs> <laughs> Wake says, I'm so sick of this machine already. <laughs> but I mean, what I, think about, I said to him, I said, This is ridiculous. 1.9 billion. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, nobody, but I mean, nobody deserves. It's only a billion off the taxes. That's right. Yeah. 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 That doesn't that's go nearly as far as it used to. <laughs> Run out of money. Yeah, by years. We should have a cutoff point for ages seven hundred and fifty million or something like that. It all moves to another set of numbers. Well, the higher it gets, the more customers that you get. Go figure it's all about greed. Mm -hmm. you work in the so that's that's my sister I My sister mentioned here that I mean, in the 70s, you could retire at 30 years of my age. Back when the next one was 30 years old, she took it as. I always thought it was like that. Survivors kind of forget where it was. Five numbers in. She retired. Six numbers. My husband was it. She missed all the ones. She got all the ones. And Princeton was very stable and conservative people. It was a five hundred dollar prize. Mm -hmm. Weren't very old at that point. She probably retired, but she probably can't. Yeah, yeah. 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 they could have been been so a little late house, and they remodeled. She was kind of like in like for three months. Five. Five seconds. Five or six. Yeah, that's the top, right? This is your best. Oh, sure, yeah. Not ready to come. Tensions mounting. Almost there. Sorry. It's okay. We're just on the edge of our seat. We're so excited. Yeah. What a fun um, game show we're on. We, we do need that music now. Did Alyssa mention that uh, there are other openings for anyone who doesn't make this round? Uh, for uh, Rec Committee? Rec committee? Yeah, we have openings on the Rec Committee. We have openings on school. There's plenty of places to serve. Thanks, viewers. <laughs> Um, do we still have fence viewers? What's that? Do we have fence viewers? We don't have no dog pasture that we're wearing. Um, we whole layers. Okay, how are you hearing? No point in having fires on the board. Really? There's two farms in the office. One farm in the office. Another one of the reason B gas. Okay. And then shut off. Success. And the farm is shipping out. Yeah, because that one has to be a chicken out of me. I don't know. Reading the newspaper for 20 years and then James said, Eight years old and never spent. That's my winning. My brother just had both knees replaced. Yeah, that's how it works. Everybody used to think that fence viewers were going to come out and resolve their boundary dispute with their yeah. neighbor. And it's like, no, their job is to do what it says. Look at the fences and then determine who's responsible, who's responsible for fixing, the fixing fence. this fence or how to apportion the fixing of the fence. It's huh. not to figure out whether your line should be here or there. It's, it's about fences. Uh -huh. okay. But we haven't had fence views for probably 20 years now. Sometimes uh, those odd goes on offices now. What's that? Sometimes those offices in Franklin County, there's a sheriff's cat there. It was the only one on the ballot. There's right, right. against somebody's been, been charged with assault. Right, yeah. 
Well, he might well be arrested because he's That's on the ballot. Right? There's nobody else on the ballot, right? So if he okay. has to be arrested, as I understand, he's a high bailout. A high bailout. That's the That's sure. Sure. So that's an office that no one really thinks about. Well, it might come into play pretty soon. Mm -hmm. All right. So. Yeah. Sorry. What do you need? Anything? No. No. One no, more like that. That's like a fact of learning, you know, civics class in high school. Right? Yeah. Or you're still learning civics yeah. class in high school. So you just need Chris's bottom? Uh, no. Okay. Nope. I think we did it. I think All we did right. it. Just need one second. I want to make sure I don't know this right. I thought it was right. I got a few towns up in the kingdom still. I think you did trust to those priests and friends. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. But now you're having to send them to the town. Yeah. We don't need this. We don't need to get off the screen. I think it's going to be a little bit more than some of the Okay, then let's just do it. Chris, we need your bottom half. Sorry, the formulas don't work without a full one to 11. So can you rank the bottom five? You did one through six, but we need to do one through 11. So can oh. you put the order for the rest of the list? Please. Thank you. Um, well, it doesn't include the latecomers. That's what you're um, asking. Can I use that? You can use that. You can use the original list. Let me see what I. I'm sorry, that I can look for one. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Sure you can just use the original list. Give me your feedback. Nine. So if I put numbers to these, can that doesn't work? No, we need the whole list. So we have those numbers one through six, but like your one could be my 10. And so we need the full total. That was a random example. That's not real. It was good in theory, though. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought I said that. You, guys you did. Period of the sentence. We did it for hiring. Yeah. And it was a um, good work. I I know. What a success. I was going to. And he agreed to be our point of contact for our company. Oh, there are they? So many points. Okay. All right. Thanks for everyone playing along at home. I know. I <laughs> Who's got their bingo card? I don't know who Google Pixel 7 is for the minutes, but I'm sure. It's like doing it's like doing a school presentation. It's if you don't have your presentation and I'm just staring at you mm -hmm. so my <laughs> <laughs> You can't yeah. even like do this first uh, name. Did you go to the informational meeting for uh, Down Street uh, where the woman's uh, that PowerPoint didn't work? Again. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <Is it hard? laughs> I'm thinking on her feet for like, oh like this. Your best friend also, your worst enemy. That was a good overall presentation. Mm -hmm. She did a great job. Yeah, yeah but when you're relying on. Yeah. <laughs> no, she, she, she yeah. had it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got there early and sitting in the room and Skip walked up and said, what are you here? 
Yeah, what are you doing here? Here <laughs> so, I am. I was kind of reluctant to say much because I didn't know. I didn't mm -hmm. feel like it would be appropriate to no. announce your candidacy right there and then there. Well, the, you know, to just start talking to a board member and tell them. So I just told them I'm, I'm a candidate, but I uh -huh. there's the process. So I wanted to respect the process. So it was yeah. before you were officially hired, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, I think, before the first interview. Oh, yeah. 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 Kind of the first interview. It's all a blur these days. Yeah. No, Skip told me that. Uh, so you, you recognize you, but you're just trying to figure out where. Yeah, where do I know that yeah. thing? Yeah, we meet them now on the same Somebody, somebody walked in and thought you were a reporter. I that can't remember. Skip. That was Skip? Okay, uh, I can't believe that, but I couldn't remember who well, that I was. Well, I have my book, you know. Yeah. Uh, new, new media. I should have used that as my cover. Yes, so the, the independent. Oh, no. Try to put him the independent. You're doing great. Doing great. Now we have this as a method. We can do the board meeting. So, yeah. honestly, this is the work we have to do. We had to figure it out. Growing thing. Going to bring the kids to the River of Light Parade. Yeah. Oh, okay. it's so magical. It's like, I mean, it might be 70 degrees. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Last okay. year was perfect. It could also be zero. Yeah. <laughs> last year was like 30 and just snow globe. It was like the best day of the whole year. And yesterday we did the um we did the disc golf at Hope Gate. Yeah, probably yeah. fifty people. I mean, it was it was you know, perfect. Day. Was was the the yeah. Do you play with kids? I'm mean, just kind of started doing it because it's gotten popular. Yeah. Okay, so, but for me, it's just you know, sometimes I say, "Hey, let's go for a hike," and sometimes yeah. they're super enthusiastic. Say, "Yeah, let's hike Mount Manfield," and they want to do a ten mile hike and climb the mountain. And some days I go, for, I say, "Let's go for a hike." And no, they don't want. They just don't want to do it. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. means if you try to get yeah. them to do it, they're going to complain. Them. So <laughs> no one wants to well, Let's that. go play a game, which is mm -hmm. essentially just walking around and being outside. Mm. Yeah. It was funny. I was I was there, and some guy who had this, you know, set of like fifteen frisbees walks up and says, "Oh, it's that frisbee you're throwing." I forget what he said. It's like it's, it's like you know, a Schumacher Model Twelve. <laughs> No, uh, it's, it's the frisbee they gave me for free when I opened the bank account. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I found it on the side of the road. Yeah, I was talking to this guy and he said he had uh, to get back that four for the piece. Yeah. 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 This is quite a great uh, assortment of different drivers and cutters and so forth. But, uh, yeah, I skilled enough to know. Well, I know the smaller ones are for the shorter distance. I don't know if this is what you're looking for. <laughs> seven to eleven, or seven to ten, or whatever you have left. <clears throat> Thanks, everyone, for your patience. One through six. Yeah. And and then the rest. Oh, you need the rest of them, right? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you did one through six, yeah. and there's five or four or five people left. Take all the remaining. Yeah, that's why you give them more. Yeah, just put them in. Well, you've been doing the whole thing. Yeah, we're going to go to Otherwise, they just get artificially low. Mm hmm. I think. By the way, uh, Skip uh, said that he was yeah. going to do his uh, sewer presentation. Oh, which would be as kind of this. <laughs> There'll be more to pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, we could have done it in the past uh, 10 minutes. Oh, uh, no. That's uh, an hour long Skip presentation. He said, he said the sewer presentation is much shorter than anybody that wanted. Really? <laughs> I can't make the joke down there. Started about 1970 instead of 18. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, I, I knew we were in for it, but he said, yeah, well, go back to the 1800s. So, okay. You could just squeeze me in. I'm not squeezing you in. That's the whole new day. I should have brought popcorn. Next one. Well, it was fascinating. I learned a lot. Yeah. <laughs>
wonder if probably somewhere out there, I'm not saying they're active in the system, but somewhere out there, there's probably still wooden pipes. We found, we found, found some wooden yeah. pipes in oh, the mainstream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were they being used? Uh, <laughs> no. By the time I could see. Did we do yeah. it? He talked about through the wisdom of group consensus. Break between voting. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna rein us in so that keep us on schedule, Shoot doing her back. So, um, schedule. I'm gonna. These were the six lowest. I would say there was six, and then a gap between folks. So, so the, uh, the winners. The yeah. the top per mm -hmm. our rankings, the folks yeah. who ranked the highest were an apologies in advance for everyone's name, Chris. Balls, you get balls on it. I don't know if I typed it wrong. Yes, Balzano, Lara Lonnen, Maddie Young, Elizabeth Danu, Joe, can I go on to my next thing? Camerata, thank you, and Elizabeth Novak Smith. Mm -hmm. Those were, oh, Eliza. Eliza, yeah. sorry. Um, Great. Those were the six lowest. I would say, do we all want to take a moment and reflect? Is there any concerns about, or does no one want to propose that slate or any further discussion? That would be the slate based on all of us ranking our preferred choices. No, I, I use my own criteria for the choice. So I'm happy with it. I think it reflects, I'll just say it does include, I know, at least one renter um, in. Architect, folks who have lived in the community, um, attorney, historic preservation. So I think it's a nice, yeah. a nice blend of folks. Um, so I will move to appoint those six folks as the public representatives on the housing task force. Um, and also, again, just acknowledge and thank everyone who applied. As you saw, although we, we were sitting here quietly, that was in part because it took a while for us all to go through. Um, everyone and appreciate everyone volunteering. And again, as has been noted, um, I think we would welcome more interest and involvement in this group, not less, but this mm -hmm. will be the official commission for the time being, um, assuming this motion passes um, and we can go from there. Could you list them again, Melissa? Yes. Chris Balls. Actually, we have a motion, so let's oh. do this. Oh, yeah, we should have a second. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. I'll second. Thank you. Further discussion? Do you want to read the names? I'm sorry. I do. Yeah. is really rough, yeah. but I highlighted them. Chris Balzano, Laura Lunen, I believe, Maddie Young, Elizabeth Danu, Joe Camerata, and Eliza Novick Smith. Oh, but this is yours. Oh, you have your original. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Any further discussion? <laughs> Okay, hearing none, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Excellent. So uh, our next steps will be to send emails out and schedule a first meeting. And um, I will personally, because everyone emailed me, I'll personally email um, everybody with the, with the results. Um, and then Alyssa, should I give them your the guest, the appointees, your email as the point of contact on the task force for now? Yeah, you can CC me, but okay. um, we still are waiting on a couple of key, but hasn't met yet, okay. and things like that. Um, okay. So, yes, we'll be in touch, but if you're willing to do that. Yes, absolutely. And, and Roger, we have a second on the motion. Sorry. Yeah. I will. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. We, uh, you know, it's um, municipal government in action. Okay. <laughs> well, in slow action. <laughs> It's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, fantastic. Next, we have a nomination from Billy Victor, who is the chair of the Conservation Committee, uh, nominating Meg Baldor for one of the open positions to serve on the Conservation Commission. Sorry, Commission, not Committee. And this would be a four year appointment? Correct. And it's one of two open. Um, places on the commission. So there's still an open place if you are passionate about conservation. I'll move that we nominate Ned Baldor for the Conservation Commission. I'll second it. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Well, she's up on Zoom if she mm -hmm. wants to. Meg, do you want to say anything? Give us, a, give us a overview of why she's interested in such a thing. Is she sure. 
sure I'd be happy to do that if you guys would like me to. Yeah. Okay. Thank well, thank you. It's nice to see everybody. Um, about three years ago, I saw an article that was called Small Forests Are a Big Deal, and it was out of um, UVM Extension. And it just completely uh, caught me. I've had a lifelong of, you know, trees and rocks and outdoor, you know, kinds of things. So it's always been in, you know, part of my life. But I saw this article and I just loved it so much because it said that small woods matter. And even if you have just a little bit of land, okay, like myself in Waterbury with some woods on it, that I could actually um, make decisions and take steps to make my little bit of woods healthier and make the whole forest healthier and make the planet healthier. So of course I loved that. Um, so that brought me to taking the course called My Backyard Woods, which is through UVM Extension. And if any of you guys have taken it, you know it's fabulous. And if you haven't taken it and you have interest in it, it's fabulous. So truly I just kind of took a deep dive into, you know, things like invasives and I don't know, thinking about forest succession and I don't know, soils and water and wetlands and canopies and understories and just like on and on and on for my own woods. Um, so that was really great. And from there I got, um, well, I got supercharged about the whole thing. And from there, I took the environmental leadership courses that's offered through the Agency of Natural Resources. And I had Andy Woods and Yen Telke, who I know have you know, worked with Waterbury um, as my trainers. So I completed level one and level two of, of the environmental leadership training. And it starts with a science. And then from there, it just goes into like all the concepts, like just boom, across the board. And then on top of that, we got to learn how to really use the mapping. So really got into all the data that's at the state level and how all these different folks who are real experts in the field really use all that information. And it's just, it's so <laughs> fascinating. I mean, I just love it, love it, love it, love it. So that's really what happened. I mean, it, it started and then I just sort of took this giant, you know, dive into it. Um, one thing about the leadership training that I loved was the mapping. So we actually learned how to do the mapping, like in a much more, how to say it, like a deeper way. Like there's many, many, many layers. And as you guys know, in our municipal plan, we have maps that go along with our plan, which are really important. And we get the help from the central office there that really helps with mapping. But in understanding all these different data sets and like where the data sets come from, how the state updates them, how you can like layer all these things, you can really look at like big issues. I mean, starting with the climate, um, watersheds, the river basins, uh, water quality, habitat, um, you know, forest blocks and connectivity. And then of course that gets into uh, community development. You know, where are you gonna plan for your growth and planning for for best growth while protecting your natural resources, you know, really thinking about community and making sure that it's working for the people in the community, like all that stuff. So I've been hooked. I, I have a background in public health. So working in public health, I actually worked in communities and that's a big part of public health or can be, and that's community planning. So a lot of it is the stuff that Waterbury, you know, is, is actively working on and, has done some fabulous work, you know, to make communities walkable and to make open spaces accessible. And the park study that's undergoing now to think about how those parks can serve the needs, you know, for people now and into the future, protecting natural resources, all that stuff. So all of that's in my background um, and I'm really passionate about it. And then things like this, I saw that the Waterbury wastewater treatment plant is like the, like the first one in the state of Vermont that actually like takes the phosphorus or whatever by binding with like heavy iron. So it's taking 95% of the phosphorus out of the water that's flowing into the Winooski and then onto Lake Champlain. And of course, we're, you know, part of the broader watershed, you know, we're 
uh, district or basin aid and all our certain streams, you know, the graves and the thatcher and where the water flows down and how it all happens. I mean, it's just so cool. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's why I'd like to be on the Conservation uh, Commission. I love the mission. I really love how in Waterbury, the commission is really um, charged to be looking obviously at natural resource protection, but also at uh, community development. And I think it's just, it really speaks to the strength of our town and the way our town handles things is to have our, our conservation commission, you know, so integrated with uh, planning and development. So I'd love to be a part of it. And, um, you know, I know that they're getting ready to do a community inventory, which a lot of uh, communities around Vermont have done, of course. Oh, that's another thing from participating in these leadership classes. I also have had the chance to work with um, folks from around the state. So I've met a lot of people on other commissions. Um, I've met people who sit in different, you know, boards, select board people, uh, recreation, you know, people like myself, I'm on the rec committee. Um, and it's just really great to be able to see what other towns are doing. And there's like so much, you know, modeling and I don't know, kind of best practice or even just like seed ideas about how we might, you know, want to consider things. Um, Thanks, so. Meg. I'm going to give the select board an opportunity to see if they have any further questions. And then, um, yeah. I, um, can I speak? Yes, Joan, thank you. Yeah, Joan Beard. And I am on the Conservation Commission. And you can see why we are very excited to have Meg join us. So I'm here to support her nomination. Thank you, Meg. Thanks, Jeff. Sounds like Meg's done a good job to get her feet wet already. So. <laughs> we didn't want to make that pun, Chris, but yes. Uh, That's a good deep dive. Thank you. Other questions before we vote? Yeah. Um, really brief, because I want to be cognizant of time. How do you envision collaborating with the select board in your work on the Conservation Commission? Oh, like absolutely collaborating with the select board. Um, I mean, by the statute and the bylaws of the commission in Waterbury, uh, the commission is really tied uh, closely with the select board working together. But I think there's also opportunity for the Conservation Commission to generate you know, ideas and, and, you know, data and do other sorts of community, you know, gathering and, and such and actually bring things, you know, forward. So I see it very much as a collaborative effort. And I also see it as, you know, certainly if the select board, you know, had certain projects or wanted to say, hey, guys, could you, I don't know, take this and run with it and come back to us. I mean, however, we could serve best is, is, how I see we could do it. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? And abstention. All right, motion passes. Thank you, Meg. Congratulations, Meg. Thank, Thank you very you. much, everybody. Thank All you. Right. And just as a point of information, I believe we're appointing her to an, uh, like, until four year terms, so I think the remainder of whatever remains so right four years, just I think they were for the same amount. I think it's I think it's from until April. Yeah, I think it's until April. Oh, and then we'll have to. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. for the <laughs> first right. and then we'll have to follow up if we need to. Thank you. I thought the term was point four is what I'm trying to think. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's in here. Um, I don't know. We'll have to don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, follow up with that, but they should have it on there. All right. Our next item is a discussion on short-term rentals in Waterbury. So what we'll, we're gonna um start with a conversation. Um among the board and I've asked for some input from um, Steve and then we'll also have input from the public. 
I want to just preface by saying this is the beginning of a conversation and just make sure the expectations of tonight are to have a discussion, to raise some questions, to talk about what might be feasible um, and what, what we might, might want to do to move forward with the conversation. Um, tonight is not going to be where we, you know, solve solve the town's problems or short term rentals or not. Um, it's a conversation to include with zoning and planning, the planning commission, um, and then of course the public as well. So I wanted to start there. Um, and I think the question that has come up is obviously housing in Waterbury is um, in high demand and in short supply. Um, and there has been concern that a lot of, um, that about the, the amounts of short term rentals and, and what, the town might do to limit or not the short-term rentals. Um, Bill, do you have some input uh, from Steve? Yeah, so at the last meeting, or when this issue came up, um, I took it upon myself after that to talk with Steve, and then I looped Neil in, our uh, assistant um, and zoning director. And um, I was talking with Steve and then, uh, he, he said, well, Neil uh, used to do this in Woodstock. So Woodstock, um, and I think at the last meeting, I said, I'm not sure what the authority municipalities have to uh, regulate this uh, because we can only do what the law allows us to do. And it, it does seem like there's enough in the enabling legislation or in the general law of the state that towns can regulate this through zoning, among other things. Uh, and in Woodstock, um, they did so. They had a registry. People were supposed to sign up. I uh, can't remember if they paid a fee in Woodstock or not to be on that registry. And then the fire chief in Woodstock actually went out and did the inspections of the property. Now their issue in Woodstock was more to level the playing field with all of the other um, you know hospitality industry mm -hmm. groups that if you have an air uh, if you have a bed and breakfast or if you have a hotel, you have certain life safety codes that you have to meet um, through the Department of Public Safety. And if you just have an Airbnb that didn't apply to you. Now, as I understand it, I think they did change the law and there's some, some regulation now in the state that says that they're supposed to meet certain um, criteria. Uh, Neil indicated that was very controversial in Woodstock. Mm -hmm. um, lots of the folks objected to the town sticking their nose into their desire to make some money. Uh, and it was uh, challenging. And I think in Woodstock, they had a volunteer fire department, but the fire chief was probably a full time employee. So they, uh, he, he, he was working, so they, they had him doing that. Um, we do have in the new um, unified development bylaws, evidently, there is language in the new bylaw that we are hoping to adopt someday um, that uh, short-term rental is uh, listed as a, uh, a use on the use table um, and it's available, it will be available if this bylaw is approved in almost every district uh, except the institutional district and that's the state office complex and the commercial industrial uh, district mostly the current industrial zone districts so that would be from the park and the other places that are listed as uh, commercial industrial. Um, so there's, Steve indicates there's been considerable discussion on the planning commission and Mary is here, she's yes. still yeah. on. Uh, Steve suggests that the planning commission has had some discussion about requiring short-term rental properties be either owner occupied or occupied by someone um, with a minimum 12 month lease that it would include renting out an entire house on a short-term basis continually. Um, so um 
What was the minimum? Just a minimum? Yeah, matter. so either owner occupied or someone has a lease to live in the house for at least a year. Mm -hmm. um, so that would mean that there would be an occupant of the house in addition, as opposed to just having a house that you just put out on the short term rental market and continually roll it over. Um, but, you know, how do you enforce that is a, a, a challenge. Uh, if you required somebody to live in the house, either the owner or uh, a tenant with a lease, then they're envisioning that's more like a bed and breakfast. Well, I'm not sure a bed and breakfast is a good argument. You could have a, you know, I guess that's for a single family home. I was going to say you could have a three unit apartment mm -hmm. building and, you know, two of the units are short term rentals and there's no kind of bed and breakfast there. But if you're requiring that of single family homes, it would be a little bit of enzymatics. I'm not sure that the tenant would make breakfast for <laughs> So, um, and then Steve kind of states the obvious. I'm sure this approach would be opposed by people who currently rent their whole house out continually. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, I think that's the, the challenge is that, you know, I said this at one of those downstreet meetings, um, the informational meeting before the, the meeting where the vote was, that government is good at being reactive. You know, we, we act to address a problem. So short-term rentals have been growing and existing for a number of years now. Now we're starting to percolate up to the top. And whatever you do to try to change the paradigm is going to cause some consternation among some people. So anyway, that's what little I have found out. Um, do you have any experience in St. Albans with dealing with this? We really didn't have this issue in a major way. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. And I've had some conversation again with, with folks, and it's, I guess it's a push pull kind of thing. Is this a bigger issue in the places where it's um, single family homes? My neighbor. Um, the house that's next door to me just sold a year ago, and now there's an occupant still living here full time. But for the six years prior, people lived in Florida. They came up for two months in the summer, came up that you know foliage season and at Christmas for a week, and the rest of the time it was in Airbnb, and was not problematic at all um, in the summertime when. You know, it's a pretty big house when four couples, each with three kids, uh, came and, you know, you had 14, 15 people in the house. It was a little bit of a, you know, you, you noticed it. Mm -hmm. And then they would just sit out until two or three in the morning because they're on vacation. They weren't bad or rude. They were just talking in their normal voice, but in the middle of the night, it carries and but you know that's taking one house out of the equation or is the bigger problem what i said before you know a three or four unit apartment building in a downtown mm -hmm. where there's an owner there and rather than rent to Alyssa uh, or, or Dan, you know for a, a one-year lease or a three-year lease whatever it is to just say well i can make more money if i have somebody here Two weekends a month, then I wouldn't rent it uh, in the entire month. You know? So, anyway, that's what I've learned so far. Thank you. Anyone else on the board have initial input or questions? I spoke to the House Minority Whip at the State House just a few days ago. That was this. He said the legislative body had no desire to touch it and it was so controversial. Um, because I was talking to him about whether or not, because I had a real estate agent called me who was very concerned about the situation that she was dealing with. Um, and so I just got back to her on that. And uh, I, 
I didn't know what there was some guidelines that the town, you know, of course, most of what we do, we have to structure what we do around state criteria, state regulations. And at this time, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot. Um, I did see, however, that when I didn't get to read the clip, I spotted it yesterday on my phone that Burlington is coming out with some type of guidelines. I'd be curious to see what those are about. Um, one thing that sitting here listening to the conversation, I said to myself, it's too bad we couldn't somehow introduce an impact fee of sorts on these Airbnbs and somehow convert that into affordable housing funding mechanism, mm -hmm. um, if that were possible. Yeah. So, if we had a registry, they had to pay a registration fee. Or excessive sales tax. Mm -hmm. You know, that whether or not that would help. Right. I mean, they're supposed to pay rooms and meals tax. If you're doing an Airbnb, you're supposed to collect the rooms and meals tax and send it to the state. And the towns that have a local option rooms and meals tax, I uh, get their 1%, well, 70% of 1% of that. Um, so, you know, there is the potential for some revenue there as well. I think you have to try to identify what problem you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. You know, are you trying to are you trying to make it more difficult to have Airbnbs because you think that they're detrimental to having a higher vacancy rate than we have? Are you wanting to register um, these to regulate to make sure like in Woodstock that they're on a level playing field with, with other folks who make their living this way? Are you concerned about that, you know, maybe they're not the safest of places? I, I know, you know, I had a, a neighbor of mine when I was chatting about our neighbor who had this, you know, the, the house in question, has a leach field that's on my property. You know, they have an easement and the leach field is on my property. And it's like, I'm not sure how great it is to have, you know, like 12 to 15 people in there for short yeah. spurts of time. And, you know, does that, what does that do to the, it's it's not my leach field, fortunately. It got a separate <laughs> one, but it's still, so is it an environmental issue? So I think you've got to think about that a little the bit. The question what, of what is the what, problem are we trying to solve? Trying to solve? You know, what's your goal? Right. Yeah, um, my impression is that the, the, the principal issue here is that uh, the Airbnb market takes longer term affordable housing off the market and it makes it much more difficult for young families and individuals that don't aren't homeowners to find a reasonable place to stay at an affordable place. And in there, and in therefore, mm -hmm. by doing that, the ones that are left, like I spoke to somebody the other night at your gathering, that had no desire, he, he's getting into the apartment rental business, uh, has no desire to Airbnb for several reasons, but one of them being that because the Airbnb is taking up so much of the inventory that it's allowing his ability to price his rentals, full-time rentals higher. Mm -hmm. Because people that because there's nothing yeah. supply and demand. Yeah. 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 Do you have anything you want to add before we open it up to public? No, I just want to, to be clear, we don't charge any impact fees for development in Waterbury right now at all for pensions or just to like, no. Williston has like a whole suite of, I don't no. even know what for schools and different things. So just say it's totally new. Um, I mean, I think I agree broadly with Roger's assessment. I mean, I'll just state, I'm really glad we just appointed six members to a housing task force looking at creating safe, decent, affordable housing for all folks in Waterbury. I want to just acknowledge we have that as a group. I think we've heard from some other communities this question of like, what is the issue? What's the state of the issue? And getting that data can be really helpful for next steps. Um, 
I think candidly, it's a really challenging issue to regulate. So trying to think about like the capacity we have as a town in particular in crafting legislation. I don't know how it finally wound up in Burlington, but I know like some of the interesting carve outs they had, if it's a multi-unit building, essentially some folks were short-term renting one unit to allow for more, a more affordable rent in the other, you know, essentially subsidizing, say I've got four units, I do this one short-term because I bring in more money and that helps keep my rent affordable. So they had like a carve out for that. They had a carve out mm -hmm. of if you're living on the property, they have more advanced mechanisms around like a housing trust fund, which we don't have right now. So to me, I think the idea of what, you know, we're seeing a housing challenge. We have some first steps with the housing task force to look at what are ways to support that. And then in terms of regulation, in my view, like what's the most effective way to do it? I mean, I think some town just is now like subsidizing home share where people who already have a home and just like what is the suite of options? And I think this might be one. And I will also say, I don't um, doubt it would be controversial. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's a reason to not do that, but I think outreach and engaging with the folks who are participating in this and why, um, regardless of what we ultimately choose to do is important. You know, I will say when I worked at RW, we have folks who, I'm gonna say operate like quasi hotel short term <laughs> rental type situation. I mean, they exist, and again, there might be a reason we want to change that, but just acknowledge that mm -hmm. they're going to be stakeholders. And briefly, before I open to public, I want to emphasize what Alyssa said is that this housing task force is going to be a really great resource so that they can take on the, the research and learning and work together, hopefully with the planning commission and, and with the select board, and that it's not just all on, on this table um, because uh, we need some folks with capacity and expertise. So um, that said, I'd love to open it up. The folks in the public, I'm going to try to keep folks to about three minutes with questions and, and statements if you have them, and, um, and then we'll go from there with discussion. So um, happy to hear from anybody who would like to speak. Sure. Yeah. Um, oh. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. All right. Uh, and then I'm going to have you come up to the table um, and just state your name, and we can pick it up since we're recording with the owl. Sure. Thank can you. I sit as I go? Oh, of course. You don't need to stand and orate. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. All right. And your name to start Yeah, Carmen. absolutely. I'm, I'm Breck Stewart, and I live here in the village. Um, I was the one that uh, requested that this be on the agenda for this uh, select board meeting. And I appreciate the discussion that's already happened so far. I think it's covered a lot of the points that I wanted to raise. Um, specifically for folks that are interested in the issue, if you haven't read the proposed changes to the zoning law, i.e. what the literature, or sorry, the verbiage is going to look like in that, I think that's an important place to start. I think it's 180 days and someone has to occupy the place, the house in order for them to be considered the full-time owner or resident as well as beyond a 12-month lease. And then at that point, you're allowed to have additional rooms as a short-term rental. Um, I think that that goes in the right direction with what we're trying to do. I'd like, we, someone asked, what is the, the problem we're trying to solve? I absolutely think the problem we're trying to solve is a housing issue. I'm not trying to come to this from an envious perspective of someone down the street has an Airbnb and they make noise and have too many cars parked in front. I don't like it. That may be true, but I don't think that that's the need of the matter here. I think the issue is kind of what, what uh, Chris alluded to is that at a certain point, things like short-term rentals are going to drive up the price of actual affordable housing in town to a point where people can't afford to continue to rent here. If we want Airbnbs to continue to be allowed, i.e. in an additional room in somebody's house, in a mother-in-law suite type situation in a residential district, things like that. Those are probably things we can look at. I will say the Burlington legislation that discusses this outright says that it's conditional use only in residential zone districts, i.e. you would have to apply for a specific permit to have a short-term rental anywhere that's zoned residential from the get-go, which I think is the, I personally think is the right direction as someone who lives in a residentially zoned area. However, I, getting back to what I was saying before, I think that the price the price of housing is only continuing to go up. And as those short-term rentals continue to take away that housing, the people who are left to pay for housing in town are going to be paying more and more premium to stay in whatever's left. 
I realize that people are trying to make money and have Airbnb out an additional room in your house is a way to do that. And I'm not trying to discourage people from making money off of these papers, mm-hmm. but there is a stark difference between that and running, like Alyssa said, what is effectively a hotel in a residential district that is full of people and that is taking up housing that can be for people who live uh, here in town. We want tourism money, we want tourism dollars, all of that makes sense. Having people come to visit Waterbury is an important part of how we have money in town. That all makes sense to me, but there's going to be nothing to visit if people can't afford to live here and work at the res and work at ProPig and you know be a part of the vibrant community that makes Waterbury special and what makes people want to come here. Look around in town. Every business that employs people here in a service industry job has a hiring sign outside. And that's not because people don't want to work. It's because people don't want to commute from somewhere where housing is affordable to work somewhere where housing is not. And, and there's, you know, there's all kinds of data in the Main Street study talking about, I think at the time it was commissioned, there were 52 short-term rentals of those 33 could be converted into actual full-time residences. I think 18 being single family homes that were already uh, in existence. I'm sure those numbers have evolved. There's one on my street that opened like three weeks ago. So I'm sure that's in the mix now as well. But those numbers are going to continue to increase because the reality of the housing market now is that with interest rates where they are and home prices where they are, it's challenging for people to buy a house. People need somewhere to rent and the people who can afford to buy and flip houses are doing so at the detriment of the people who want to live here in town and be a part of the community. I think I've well exceeded my <laughs> Not barely. <laughs> I, Thank you. That's that's the opinion I wanted to present. I look forward to hearing what the housing task force folks, as well as the rest of you guys, think about that. But I echo the comments made before that this will probably be controversial and will probably be difficult. But I think that is that is not a reason that we shouldn't pursue trying to make it work anyway. Because making housing available for people who want to live in Waterbury is is an important priority that deserves our attention. Thanks. Thank you. And one just yeah. clarifying comment, I think, Brett, and you correct me if I'm wrong, the verbiage you referred to, I just want to say that's the current draft of the proposed unified that development bylaw. Yes, yes, yes. So just if anyone wants to follow bylaw. along at home, yes. um, it is now on the planning and zoning page, unified development bylaw phase one, there's a draft, and if you control F, short-term mm-hmm. rental, that's yeah, the, the justice. Yeah. I'm going to have one more in the room, and then Tom will have you after that. Come on, you can come on. <laughs> uh, my name is Kate Sweeney. I live in the village where I live in the center. I've spoken here before, I think, about the roads. <laughs> um, he essentially said most of what I was going to say. I'm glad that he brought up the labor aspect completely because it's not that we're running out of housing for renters, there's no housing for renters. You go on Craigslist. You go on Facebook Marketplace, there's zero housing. And there's maybe one apartment, and that apartment is a one-bedroom apartment that costs $2,600 a month. It's At this point, it's not a problem anymore. We've reached a fever pitch of now Airbnb is, has completely dried up our renting market. And then on top of that, the price of buying property has skyrocketed to the point where people who were going to leave the housing market to buy property can no longer do that. And if you look at Burlington's Airbnb proposal or their their short-term rental proposal, it's comprehensive. To me, looking at that, it essentially shuts down anyone who can't afford to play the game. So anyone who's just renting, you know, a building that they own completely out, if they can't afford to do the the fire checks, they can't afford to pay the hotel fees. They can't. They're out of the game. They have to rent those apartments to long term rentals. It essentially just kneecaps anyone who's going to what essentially is is greed. You're drying up the, the renting in the town. There's no one who can live there, and you're just using it specifically for tourism. So this this problem has reached a critical mass where something has to be done. I'm so glad that the, you've got this commission that you're starting and you picked out your candidates. And I'm very happy to hear that at least one of them is a renter because hearing from architects is great. Hearing from people who are going to build buildings is great. But buildings go up in two, three, four years. People need houses right now. And that's exactly what that renter is going to tell you. Mm-hmm. So 
the proposal, everything that you come up with at this table needs to be done, I think, at a more quickened pace than typically proposals are done in any town because it's a huge problem in this town. It's not, it's not just a ankle biter anymore. That's all I have. Thanks, Dan. And it's yeah. not, you know, it's not just this town. It's no, it's every snow, yeah, it's snow. It's, it's especially snow. snow. Well, they all live for Everyone who works in snow. Uh, Tom? Um, yeah, Tom Scribner. I just want to say, I think we're in a nomadic society now where people don't have to be somewhere to go to work. I think any point in time, I think Waterbury probably has 20% more people in it than what we have for population. And uh, I know right around the center, there already are houses that are bought as investments and run strictly as uh, Airbnbs. I know that in a very close proximity to where we are, there are multiple unit Airbnbs, as many as three, as many as five that are ongoing. Uh, my bigger thought on it is about the financial aspect. I watched crushed, crushed stone go up the hill truckload by truckload last spring because we had the worst mud season that we've had in years. And of course, the more traffic, the worse the roads get, the more stone you need. So these people are paying the house owner, but the town is not being paid for the use of town services, whether it's the septic plant or the roads. And I think that has to be considered in the money that's coming in with them staying in individual houses. So that's the basic point that I, I would like to make is that, yes, money's changing hands. I don't see how the town is being paid for the extra stress on the services that the taxpayers of the town have to pay for. Thanks, Tom. Yes, come on. And then uh, we do one in the room, and then Eliza will have you uh, speak next. I'm Kelsey Appleby. I live in the village. Um, I just I want to bring up that I think the economic perspective is really important that people living in affordable housing can bring labor to our town. But I also want to bring up that you know Waterbury is a beautiful place to live, and it's climate resilient, and it's a special place, and it shouldn't just be for people that can afford to. To buy these houses and rent them out for, for short term. Um, you know, housing is for labor, but it's also for people. And I think Waterbury deserves to have a more diverse populace. Um, and we can just we can bring in a lot of people, a lot of different perspectives here, different, you know, different racial perspectives, different socioeconomic statuses. And I just want to bring up that point that it's also for the people. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. Thank you. Eliza? Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Sorry. I'm Eliza Novick Smith. I'm up in um, Waterbury Center. And I recognize that this is an ongoing conversation, but want to just, um, I came sort of recently ish from another small mountain town that was probably five years ahead on these issues um, and just want to flag at the outset, A, echo everything everyone else has said, but that the constituencies who will be against any changes will show up. I'm sure this is not news to anyone, but, and the constituencies that are going to benefit probably, like the homeowners, the potential homeowners who don't are not able to buy homes in Waterbury, are not gonna to come to the select board meetings. And likewise, the potential renters who don't get, um, who are not able to rent in Waterbury are gonna be less vocal, but no less in need of like the urgent attention to this issue. Um, so just thinking ahead, making sure that like the, the new group and the select board also anticipates and all of the, like the rejoinders are out there. Burlington has dealt with this. Other towns have dealt with this. Woodstock and towns in other parts of the country that have dealt with this. Like Waterbury is potentially at an advantage insofar as it can learn from and have ready responses to some of the challenges because they're common now. Um, but that feels like a really important piece because it's going to be the folks who don't want 
any restrictions who are going to come and show up in force once they realize this is happening or anything is happening. Not that it needs to be bad, but like any change is hard. Um, so just there are good responses, but they can't all be thinking about the money piece feels really important too. And in the place where I had to leave because of these issues, um, that was the like the most persuasive argument was always came down to how much it's going to cost. Well, thanks for your input, Eliza. And we look forward to having you help us craft some of those responses on our housing task force. Um, were there any other hands, folks? Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, I know I'll be stepping off the stage here soon. Uh, I just want to remind the board um, you just appointed someone to the Conservation Commission a few minutes ago. And I just want to remind all of us that there's no there's no there's no single issue. Mm -hmm. The same people are talking about affordable housing are talking about the need to conserve open space and conserve land. And because I wear the e flood hat, and I'm not saying this is a bad thing or a good thing, but there's a considerable amount of acreage on Rush Hill that is next to water and sewer. It, it, water and sewer is now available to it. The, the village over the past four or five years has uh, spent money, worked with uh, the, the folks who built where Dean Salvis's uh, 60 apartment units are there on Blush Hill. We got grants. We, we uh, did work on the water system to be able to get uh, gravity feed, high pressure water up further on Blush Hill. And now there's a, a deal that's going to happen before the end of the year that's going to take 60, 80, I don't know how many acres it is, but it's a lot of acreage that's coming off of, it's gonna be conserved, preserved forever. It's open space. Um, we have 60% of our town is conserved. It's in the Mount Mansfield and Putnam State Forests. And I'm not saying that little pockets here and there View sheds. You know, I know. Uh, you know, Chris and I probably had similar feelings when the the field there um, near Henry Myers's barn was started to be developed. It was a beautiful space on Lewis Hill. Went up above, you know, went around that corner from Thatcher Brook. There was nothing there. Now there's there's houses going in there, and it, it's sad to see that field with houses in it because it was such a pastoral scene, mm -hmm. like that picture over there. But now there's some houses going in. So I just want to remind all of you that there are competing interests that we all seem to want our cake and be able to eat it. And we've got to figure out how we're going to address this and keep all of those things in perspective. It's not a bad thing to conserve land and to keep it open. But where we do that, I think, is something that I wish there was a little bit more thought about because if you're going to have dense development and be able to make an impact and make it affordable, you need water and sewer. So maybe you shouldn't be trying to conserve parcels that are easily served by the water and sewer system that is in existence today. The water and sewer system needs customers to try to keep the rates reasonable for the people that are already on it. Uh, and we need housing. And if you're going to have housing that's going to make a dent in the, the marketplace, you're not going to make a dent in the marketplace by trying to build, you know, 50 houses up far away from places where water and sewer can exist because the land prices are too high. The cost of building is too high, and you know you every house is one more house uh, that's in your that's in your um, you know in your uh, inventory, and every house helps. But where those houses are, what kind of housing you can build, 
is really critical. So just as you think about these public policy issues, just remember there's competing interests and we're all on kind of both sides of that corner. It's a good reminder. I think a lot of times we look at the committees and commissions and boards in silos, and it's a really good reminder that we it works best and we're all talking to each other to make decisions about the town. Uh, anything else? Mary, are you raising your hand or are you just sitting that way? Yes, okay. because I can't okay. figure out how to do the little hand raising thing. Okay. Um, <laughs> Me either, Mary. <laughs> I've done it before and some other, but I I don't see it. Um, I'm here as someone who, um, you know, is just a town resident, village resident. I think this is a critical issue. I think it's a very complex issue. I'm also a member of the planning commission, but I'm not here to speak on behalf of the planning commission. We a spectacular landlady. <laughs> <laughs> Who's right, who who doesn't want to do Airbnb ever because you've got to clean up after people all the time. <laughs> but um I I think it is a very complex issue and listening to all the input, it it touches on the conversations that we've had in the planning commission when we gave input for the draft, but we have not with the current planning commission had a full discussion about the draft regulations. They were um, part of the um, unified development bylaw draft that um, Brandy, whose last name is escaping me, put together and pulled some of these recommended um, possible regulations for short-term rentals from some of her other work. Uh, so we, what the point to this thread is that we, I think we need a real, a public hearing that includes the select board, the planning commission, and perhaps the housing task force to really get a sense, I think, Eliza brought, brings up a really good point, but I think hearing from people and bringing stories, I mean, I, you know, I'm aware of, you know, the dangers in larger cities, whether it's Burlington or um, where I grew up in New Orleans, a whole different urban area, but after Hurricane Katrina, a lot of opportunists and developers and people with cash came in, bought houses, did a lot of Airbnbs. And at night, many nights, it's just instead of a neighborhood, there's black, uh, you know, if you're not renting and you don't have people who stay there, you, you don't have a neighborhood anymore. So that's like one extreme that we, I think, still have time to get ahead of. We're never going to be a a Burlington or New Orleans, but I think we do have neighborhoods that we cherish and we want them to be largely um, inhabited by people who are invested in part of the community. And then we also have community members who choose to, you know, use an apartment or over their garage or in their house, Airbnb, because they also have family who live there part time and I don't think we want to cut those people out either. I I would like to hear from a you know give everybody an opportunity to come and um, share their thoughts and their perspective and their anecdotes. And before we go off in a direction, whether it's the select board or the planning commission or the housing task force, without a little more input. So that's just my personal opinion. Thank you, Mary. Anyone else on this topic before we move on? Excellent. Thank you, everybody, for your input. Wow, we ambitious timeline on this agenda. Yeah. <laughs> We're doing great. Thanks. Uh, the, <laughs> the next topic uh, E is a social media policy discussion. So um, at a couple of select board meetings, um, citizens have brought up uh, questions about the use of personal social media by folks on boards, commissions, or committees. 
um, acting as something within the violation or if it was appropriate, but we don't have a policy. So what we have at the town is a policy for staff members um, using town social media and then certain departments like the recreation department has their own social media policy for their employees. But we don't have one that's uh, overarching that can be used by all boards, committees, and commissions so that if an issue comes up, we have nothing to point to to say this is or isn't in violation. So what I sent to the board was some examples of things that can be included that are used by other towns. Um, and I think some of the big questions like Bill asked with the housing is what, what's the problem we're trying to solve? That's the, the question before we take action is, um, sorry, I'm trying to find that email that I sent you, um, is what, what are we trying to, to do? What, what's the point? What's the purpose? Um, are we the people to create this? I don't even know if that's something that we do or that staff has to do. Um, and then is it just a framework that we provide to all boards and committees saying, use this as a basis, but add to it if you like, or this is not the template, this is a mandate. So those are kind of the big questions. And then, Bill, I don't know if you have any answers to any of those questions. Um, <clears throat> Not really, <laughs> um, and I, okay. I would encourage Tom to chime in. Yeah. So first things first, if it's going to be a town policy, then it has to be adopted by the board. Mm -hmm. um, uh, staff can put in place, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, practices, standard operating procedures, that kind of stuff. So if I wanted to um, kind of direct staff and this is more or less how the recreation one came up. There were issues, you know, way back when, when we first started, uh, you know, the issue, the first issue that came up with recreation was just, well, are you going to allow, you know, are we going to post photographs on the Facebook pages or on a website or something like that? And we had to give parents the chance to say, you know, don't think that there's a mic or what have you. And then, um, you know, it probably walked uh, beyond that. And then it's getting a little bit into what types of things are okay to talk about. And so, but a policy would be a, a board adopted policy. And you can direct that policy how you want it. Um, you know, you can say this is the policy for the organization. And, and you might be able to have some sub standard operating procedures for that policy in particular departments. Um, it's, it's not real intuitive to me because I'm not a social media user, if you haven't figured that out yet. Um, and it's always walking a fine line if you're going to try to tell somebody just by virtue of the fact that they sit on a board for a particular community, or if they're employed by a particular community, that they cannot say something on their own social media platform. I mean, you've got free speech issues and, and you have to be really careful about that. And, and you know, some, uh, some folks try to say, well, it's very simple. You know, if you work for the town, you can say taxes are too high on your social media website. Well, you you know, you really can't yeah. say that, you know, and you might really <laughs> feel that. And uh, uh, so it it is a little bit of a challenge. So having said that, no, I don't have any answers. Mm -hmm. That's fine. I, I didn't and I mean it's Tom has the same experience. So and the other thing too is what's the problem mm -hmm. you're trying to solve? And one of the things Tom and I have found that we agree on a little bit. We're going through a process right now with that fellow Mike Gilbar that I told you I wanted to hire to do some financial work and get address things that the audit raises. Um, having a policy can handcuff you as well. Mm -hmm. And how many policies do you? want and need and does everything have to really be addressed by a policy so like he was going to say something mm -hmm. then I, uh, <laughs> Thanks, I've, I've read a few and, and the blct has a has a model but it also pertains to staff um, the only common thread i found is that 
many of them give the select board um, pretty clear guidelines that they can essentially expel you from a committee. Um, if you're posting information about your work and the committee is not factual. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can in essence denigrate the work of the committee and someone on the housing task force can say uh, something contrary to what most others believe and that's fine. But um, if you stick to the facts, otherwise it's free speech. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the only clear thread uh, that's out there. And many towns, uh, their attorneys have specifically said to simply avoid this, that it's, it's too fraught with the power of the stage. Um, a couple of the things that were included, because I'm also very hesitant to have a huge list of don'ts when legally I don't actually understand the ramifications, but a couple of things um, are violation of open meeting law, right? So Chris posts something on Facebook and Roger, me, and Alyssa are all commenting and discussing that technically is in violation of open meeting law. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's pretty clear, cut and dry that could apply as policy. Um, and then a couple of other pieces are, you know, that like this is a personal, like not representing yourself professionally via your personal Facebook, but I still don't know legally if we can do that, like, can I use my personal Facebook on, um, you know, the, the WADA Facebook to say, there's a meeting tonight about, you know, recreation, everybody should come. I don't, I wouldn't do that. I don't think that's appropriate, but I don't think I can be dictated not to do yeah, that. It, so, um, so I'm pretty hesitant I think if we want to create something, my opinion is that it should be pretty bare bones. Um, and although it feels maybe an extreme, and I don't know about the investment, but like we should consult a lawyer because I don't want to put us into a position where we're creating something that is in violation of somebody's rights. Yeah, you definitely, if you're going to develop a social media policy, you will absolutely yeah. want a lawyer to look at it. and. The legal firm that we use takes a pretty, maybe you don't want to go down that road mm -hmm. uh, kind of perspective, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, I just had a question. Uh, are, is the GRB and the other uh, commissions we have, this new housing task force, all subject to the open meeting laws? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And those are reasonably strict uh, about the use of uh, social media uh, in terms of not conducting business outside right. of the right. conduct, meeting. Can't right. conduct business. And, and, Thank and, you. You know, that, the example that Dan used is a good one. You know, if you put something on your own Facebook page and then, and if it's related to town business, you know, not your right. son's birthday or something like that, but it's related to town business and then Danny comments on it. And then Melissa comments on it. Now you're conducting a <laughs> meeting, and, right. and you're you are in violation. And it's one of those things that I'm not sure anybody who's ever been in violation of the open meeting law has ever been prosecuted. <laughs> and, you know, it's it's but it is it's, it's not it's not right. a good look. You don't right. want to encourage that. The 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 issues that really in my mind seem to come up more is when, and it has to do, the ones I'm experienced with are employees who mm -hmm. are told they have to do this, this, and this in their job, and then they go out and they denigrate that or they mm -hmm. criticize that. And it's not helpful, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's not in the interest of the organization of a, as a whole, can they be disciplined for that, fired for that? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it depends on what the position is. And I think that the standard is that the higher up you are in the chain, the more to the party line you're supposed to be. So, you know, if you're the police chief, you ought not to be mm -hmm. really critical yeah. about something. But if you're the secretary in the police department and you want to say something is stupid there's a little bit more leeway that way and it, it sounds um 
you know, it doesn't sound fair, but it's, I think it's commonsensical that you just have to be cognizant of the position that you hold and mm -hmm. try to be a little bit circumspect about what you say and how you write that into a policy. Right. Chris, you have one? Yeah, I've been hearing a lot of conversation about something that, I mean, don't trust me as being that expert because I am not, you'll never find me on social media. Um, but it sounds like the, the information or the things that are coming out of some of these people who have been appointed to these positions in these committees is what's causing the rift. So is it as simple as saying, anything that pertains to anything that your committee is charged with investigating or looking into can only come out of the committee by agreement amongst of you, everybody. You can't just go off on your own and start, you know, keep your mouth off about something that mm -hmm. if, if, you're, if you're taking the responsibility to be on a committee, then anything that comes out of that committee should come out of the committee itself and not you personally. But what right. if it's factual and public information? Yeah. So if it's true and it's not false, so if you're going and saying, well, we decided that X, Y, and Z, and it's not true, obviously that's a problem. But if it is true and it's not private, it's not done in executive session, why or how can we limit your right. free speech and to post that? So what you're saying is, is absolutely what the the goal should be, the right. standard should be, but it's in practice, you can't make somebody totally the party line that. And it's, you know, I've always, I've always encouraged, you know, the boards that I've worked for. Okay, you know, when you're coming up to, to town meeting, um, you know, we discuss an issue. Uh, it's a three to two vote in here. Now that means it's the town's policy. We're going in this direction. I've encouraged boards. Once the decision is made by the board, it would be very helpful if we all could get in line and support the decision. The, the decision has been made here. But you get to town meeting sometime and one select board might say, well, you know, the board voted to do it this way and that's why they want to go that way. But I voted against that, and this is why. And you, you can't tell somebody that they can't give their reasons. Is it is it good public policy? Does it help get you where you want to go? No, but it, it's hard. You can't muzzle people, so it's a, it's a tough challenge. No, and I wasn't suggesting that you take and you, limit that. I, may I sum? I think what you were sure. saying is that if there's an announcement or information to be given, it should be given by the committee in a public way via the whole committee, not one person going well, out. If somebody, somebody disagrees with what the committee has said, then they, for some reason, want that public, then it should come out of the committee as a statement by the committee that we voted this way, but this person voted that way. For whatever reason, if he wants it stated, or if they want it stated, I mean, you can, I mean, that yeah. happens once in a while. You know, I'm going to vote no. I want to explain my vote. It's in the minutes. Why? Right. Voted. It'll be in the minutes. I've been in the minutes. Yeah. I know, but but <clears throat> while that might be the preferable way, the, the what we're trying to say is you can't dictate that. best practice versus you legality. Just, you, you can't dictate what people do. That I mean, in your comment about you know somebody at the at a lower level being less. I guess uh, we'll pull out upon less accountable. Accountable, yeah. I mean, that's leadership comes with certain yeah. responsibilities. Responsibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why you're supposed to be a leader to you know to, to be held to a higher standard. Mm -hmm. Right. And that, that's what I mean. But again, it doesn't you'd like that person to be circumspect and, and right. everything else. And some I mean, there's plenty of times where I in my career have stood up and, and said, you know, this is what we need to do. And it's, I've argued in here that this isn't where we should go, but the board makes the decision and it's incumbent upon me at that point. And I would argue that 
it would be unethical for me in the, the profession that I'm in to publicly say, well, the board voted to do this and this is where the town is going, but I really think we ought to do this. That would be unethical, but it's not illegal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's say that's the matter. I mean, in terms of what issues, the issue I would be really concerned about is like misrepresentation or false. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the thing I see that's challenging. Is I think it's very challenging, as we said, for us to manage any of this. I think candidly, some of I'm aware of very few complaints. The one case I'm aware of complaints has to do with attribution of saying, are you speaking on behalf of a board or committee or as an individual? And I don't know to what extent we would want to regulate that through a policy or otherwise. I mean, the things that I claim is um, open meeting law, I think it's valid. And I think our general education to boards and committees about open meeting law can probably be improved with appropriate caveats to that. Mm -hmm. I think if I'm thinking of things that as a board member that would concern me is I would hate to have I think acknowledging that in general, we're all using good judgment in terms of like, I'll just say I have social media accounts. I post on them in an incredibly limited way. They're kind of just there. Um, I am friends with folks in Waterbury, but not a ton of them. Again, they have, but I do want to know at certain points I've said like, oh, we have, you know, we're doing X, Y, Z. Here's the link to the town website. And I've shared only publicly available information that's posted elsewhere, but I, like there's the piece of like I'm a select board member and my I'm not speaking on behalf of the select board, but I don't necessarily say on every single post. This is not an official post on behalf of the right. select board. I am sharing this for general information in the community. Can you imagine reading reading prep porch form like that? But I would say that would be the if there was issues around clarity. I think to me that's a again a piece of like I think the best practice is that the committee should have a spokesperson that all the information should live on the town website that you should reference those available sources, but I don't know that the creation of a policy, I one, don't know that we have a major issue, again, I'm mm -hmm. very limited complaints, but two, that creating a policy would be a way to solve it. But that would be the thing that would really concern me is the like, on behalf of affiliating individual right. misattribution. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Tom. So it sounds like the themes I'm hearing are clarity, misrepresent sorry, misrepresentation, um, there's the public meeting law issue, um, is a better, is a simple approach in the short term just to, uh, to have staff work with the select board to draft a memo that could go out to everyone serving in your committees saying, this is what's contrary to open meeting law. This is what we think is appropriate behavior. Yes, I, that. I think so. And I, I would take it, um, my opinion is that we do just that. We outline some best practices, as you just mentioned, and then we talk about a chain of command, so to speak. What's the protocol? So is it, you don't necessarily come to a select board meeting first. If you see something you're concerned about, you go to the chair of that board or committee or commission and you start there and they can help and work it out. If it becomes a big conflict that needs to come to the select board, perhaps that's the next step, um, but giving autonomy to the chairs of the boards and committees to help you know, regulate, that's why they're there. Sorry, go ahead. No, you go. No, you go. Um, so follow-up question. So this discussion has been about the select board and other boards. Um, if there's a desire for staff to have increased use of social media, um, give us some runway to work on a policy first. Is the request. Excellent. I would. I just I, say the same I thing. I understand there's a policy, but it's pretty strict to wreck at this point. Yeah. So I recall. Right. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just I mean, we don't have, at least to the best of my knowledge, except for wrecking anything. We don't have a town Facebook site or a Twitter account right. or anything like that. Um, and you know, there's some communities that feel that that is a very effective way to be able to engage with the community. Um, and, you know, because I'm. At the tail end of my career, and I never got into that. It's not a direction that you went. But if you want to do that, that's where I think this whole best practices is important. And you know, it's and again getting back to adopting policies in general. It's you adopt policies where there's 
disagreement about things, right? Mm -hmm. If everybody was on the same page, you don't need a policy. Mm -hmm. right? And you know, we have a conflict of interest policy, mm -hmm. and and conflict of interest policies, you know, the, the title is very clear. You shouldn't have a conflict, but how how do you regulate that? Conflict of interest policies first are supposed to be self-policing. Mm -hmm. right? You as right. individuals have to say, I have a conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you may know there's an issue, but you don't think it's a conflict, so you don't recuse yourself. Somebody else might think it. Um, eh, it takes a big step for a board to say, well, Roger has a conflict, but he's not willing to admit it. And now we're going to basically take a vote to tell him he can't participate in this particular issue. It, it gets murkier and cloudier all, all the time. So policies by virtue of what you're trying to do are always a bit nebulous and mm -hmm. hard to implement because you're trying to fix an issue that is out there. And, you know, in Vermont, conflicts of interest, I mean, you know, um, yeah. everybody, you know, I mean, it took me about 10 years in Vermont to finally learn that I shouldn't talk about somebody until I was absolutely sure they weren't your seventh cousin or something <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> because they usually are. Thank you, Bill. Um, you can always get a holy anything, <laughs> yeah. I just think the, the great, great step forward is uh, to uh, put together a memo on best practices and uh, circulate it. I'll make sure that doesn't fall off. Right. Um, next, we have uh, who knows what number FG F oh, oh, no, F first board's work plan for management team two months. Thank you. That was Tom's suggestion, so. Okay. Good night. Um, good night. Thank you. So it was a general thought process was that obviously these issues to tackle on day one that we can get into in a, in a few minutes. And then obviously much of transition involves a lot of history lessons that I'm getting. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure um, if there was anything specific um, above and beyond some of the major items some of the history of the budgets, all those obvious things that the board wanted us to focus on while we were both still here. There may not be anything above and beyond what we're working on, what we plan to work on, but I just want to make sure that the question out there. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have this answer right, right now. now. Yeah. You know, there's <laughs> a follow-up. There'll be a meeting in two weeks. So mm -hmm. and and you know you can email us individually, you know. And, We'll let the rest of the board know for you what you've asked us to do. I think Tom said it. No. Uh, and, and I, I said many times over the, the weekend to people who have talked to me, I, I don't think I'm going out the door on the 31st of December and just saying, well, that's that. <laughs> you know, we've got nothing else to, to do. But if there is something in particular that You've been mulling over. Let us know. You know, to see what we can do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think one of the things that you obviously heard is that uh, we have a town that's managed by two different municipalities. Um, and right now, I think we're working reasonably well together, uh, but that hasn't always been the case. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so, uh, and Bill's lived through this for 34 years uh, so you know and, and i think he's got a plan in mind of how ultimately that, that can get resolved uh and uh, so i think you know just hearing that, that out and continuing to move forward uh, <laughs> is a good idea okay yeah um yeah i would say for both i defer to Bill slash your professional expertise and certainly not saying two two month time frame, but in the same vein, we've had the lovely personnel policy. And I know Bill has already said he's worked on it and had a legal review. And not if not two months. I'm not saying two months, but I'm just saying it because mm -hmm. it was asked. Mm -hmm. um, no, that's fine. <laughs> under, under C on the 815 item, you know, 
45 minutes ago. Yeah, yeah. We missed them. We haven't talked about that. Today. And my next one was hiring. That's our one to do. We did take that that's on when we thought the meeting would actually end. So I'm uh, curious. I, no, we just, I told uh, Karen when she put it together, I said, well, keep it the same if we go over. <laughs> no one excited. And as I said, the other night, meeting agenda time. I looked, at, I looked at a lot of minutes over <laughs> the other day. Okay. The, the, I was reminded how many meetings that I lived through that ended at 11 30 or after at night. I so will not stand for we're, that. We're quite early no good government after 10 p.m. Oh, yeah. We have a motto. Um, Chris, did you have anything right now for that, or do you want to follow up as... on this particular question? Yes. Sir. Well, I'm just sitting here listening to all this and, and watching what's happened over time. Um, I've always had this, I guess, philosophy, if that's the right word, or, or witness that when things get, especially like companies, corporations, government, when they get bigger, they become more inefficient and more effective. Uh, I just wonder if there's ways that we as a town, without being irresponsible, can limit just how much we put in our basket and try to take on and handle uh, because it becomes so overwhelming uh, at times because you only have so much time on your hands to deal with it. And as the basket gets fuller, each item gets less and less time paid attention to it. Uh, and therefore, <clears throat> things just become inefficient. And I've tried to express this idea or thought process that bigger isn't better. Um, that's why I don't live in Burlington. And I've always wished, even though growth is a expectation or is a reality, what can we do to try to keep it in a smaller basket? So that we don't lose control of it. And, uh, you know, I guess keep that in mind when we're adding, adding, adding. You know. Chris, you want to keep going? Bolton gravel? Too, sorry. Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, my other just, and I said, we have employment later about hiring. Just, I know we know of some vacancies now and some in the future, and I don't know what the plan is. But just well, knowing that you know, yeah, yeah, that I, is, uh, it's the first thing I said, I know we'll discuss it later. So okay. I just reiterated <laughs> um, it. And then, um, as a new board member, I don't know if there's like an annual calendar, and this might be something you have internally anyway as you're reviewing things with Bill. I know January is budgeting, um, but if mm -hmm. you just thinking of resources, I would have appreciated around like cycles of annual things. Just and that, and that might more be, I would say, don't create something special for us, but if there's a resource that feels like it could mm -hmm. be applicable to an annual calendar schedule, if it's something I personally would be interested in. Mm -hmm. Is to try to do a board member orientation, mm -hmm. you know, like one agenda item of the meeting, but uh, had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Totally understand. Haven't, haven't had a lot of opportunity to do that. You still did a have... little bit of it, but you know, investments and try to, you know, bring up speed speed. Yeah. different things. I wonder if putting those together as like a packet with the video or a special meeting or like an actual orientation. I know that was something when I came on the board, I was totally blindsided. Like I felt like the, the VLCT training is a state level it's broad overview and has nothing, like yeah. didn't really impact the day-to-day. -day. And you, my first year, we had more of those on the agenda, but I yeah. feel like it's, it's just, they've been so full, it's hard to. Well, it's hard, it's, it's hard. I mean, yeah. when I, you know, staff, Four boards, you know, four elected boards, and it used to be five. Mm -hmm. And it's just sometimes, you know, 
you put an agenda together and say, well, it's already going to be 930 <laughs> and I haven't even put any of that stuff on. Mm. So we'll, we'll try. We're wish listing. No, they gave us the opening, so we're taking it. That's yeah. all. But yeah. no, no hard no. All right. Both and gravel plan update. Short and sweet. So I sent Steve Wilder down to get a load of fresh gravel the other day and he called me and said, you can't have it. Uh, he said, I'm, I'm sitting here back up to a pile of 4,000 yards and she won't give me one load. So I had to come back with a load of road sand. But my yard. So then I hear that uh, Chip Abair got sent down by Celia, I suspect, to get a couple loads of gravel. And he was sent home without it. Uh, and then I was told that there'll be nothing more coming out of that pit from here on out other than the winter sand. Same. Yeah. Yeah, I heard the same thing. Woody, Woody told me about that, and it might have been because of the chip thing. But um, I think he said Stevie actually told him that. And I asked Woody to try, not that I wasn't believing what he heard secondhand, but I asked him to try to confirm, you know, call somebody and get the scoop. And I'm not sure if he's made the call. I mean, this is just like Wednesday or Thursday mm -hmm. last week. So uh, I didn't think to ask him before tonight's meeting. But yeah, it's a concern that I've heard. Too. So it sounds like what I had feared right along was starting to come to fruition. Um, so just to let you know that, you know, was my sense of urgency, you know, I, I wish that town select board had taken the opportunity when they had it the last time uh, with the court. Uh, but I, I don't think it's something that we want to what draw off from our radar um, because it could become a very expensive issue for yeah, us in the future. It definitely will. And maybe it was a meeting that were you at the meeting? I think it maybe was with Celia we were talking about some issues. And um, you know she was going to be looking into how far do they have to go field if they can't get it yeah. there. And I know I had the conversation with her, and she was like, well, you know, we'll probably have to do more of our own hauling because it's going to cost too much. And I said, well, whether it's Bolton or if it's, uh, you know, Hyde Park or Morrisville or wherever, you pick it. I mean, if it's going to be an uh, hour and 45 minute round trip, doesn't just hire a contractor to do it. Otherwise, you're going to have nobody here to do any work they just be driving on yeah. and that you know it's wear and tear on the truck it's not going to be any cheaper in the long run given the wear and tear in the truck four the, loads a day the uh the fuel and you get four loads a day and that's all the production that you have well so, number one the, the size of the trucks are only carrying half of what right I'm well even if you just used our pan right but so still. but in the past she's had just recently she, she's had the boys haul sand. Uh, unfortunately, those small trucks burn just as much fuel per trip as the big ones do. And you're hauling half of what right, they exactly. you know. exactly. uh, And then again, as there's a wear and tear. And the big ones not do anything except drive. Exactly. exactly. So it doesn't make sense to haul our own. Uh, and if you put, put these types of things out to bid, you know, uh, tend to do a little bit better on pricing, but uh, sometimes the better solution is to have our own quarry right up here on the hill, uh, if we could get it, so mm -hmm. that's it. Great segue into our conversation about the input for the ARPA use of funds, because this is part of that. Um, so this is not uh, a short conversation, but it is something we, we want to 
get to because oh, I thought it was a review of next steps or I'm soliciting input. Did I misunderstand? That was mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I don't think it's gonna be short okay. because we have to approve the survey and your letter, right? Well, that's the question. <laughs> I guess I'm just not no, I just yeah. want to like be real about time and different yeah. things. I know I just circulated mine very early this morning, a draft of letter. You circulated a draft of a survey. Mm -hmm. I know I, for one, have not given you any feedback on said survey, yeah, but way. Roger has A plus on his homework, has the mailing center raring to go mm -hmm. yeah. um, for distributing it. So figuring out what our next steps for getting approvals. I know Tom was kind enough to offer to be the point of contact. So if mm -hmm. you wanted to call a human on the phone, um, so to review, our ideal was to have input at a Monday, December 5th meeting and to have the surveys out to folks in the mail in enough time before that, which would be this, this week. Otherwise, it's not, I don't know, it's going to be a little late. So with that in mind, we have a, a draft of a letter that would go out and the draft of a survey. Um, so the next steps are, are approving both, deciding that they work as our first step to solicit input, um, deciding we don't like them, we wanna go a different route, um, and, uh, and then deciding you know, a deadline of, of getting things in the mail and getting things printed. Or that's it, printed in the mail. Um, so yeah, I did not have time to read your letter today. So I have no, I don't have input. So we can either hash it out out loud today. We can see if folks have capacity by the end of the day tomorrow to email any feedback. Um, or we can just... Uh, <laughs> and I'll just name one consideration for the letter is we want the survey to ultimately live on the municipal website. Um, so I did call Karen today. Obviously, she will be at the polls all day right. tomorrow. So just to name realistically, I don't think we're going to have to. I'm sure probably someone else could do it as well. But um, my thought would be we want to make sure we have the appropriate URL link to the right survey before mm -hmm. we put something in the mail so that someone, when they go to the site, it goes to the right place. Um, so just to name my thought would be Wednesday would be a potential deadline for things. Right. Thank right. You. I don't know what the back end turnaround that comes on that. I still think, I think we could accept surveys after the public. To me, I mean, folks can see the letter. I did a table with three columns. We're seeking your input on funding. You can fill out the survey and mail it back to us. You can do an online form or you can come in person. Um, so they work in tandem versus like. Yeah, I, I to me it's. Mm -hmm. choose your adventure um, they just need advance yes. and yes. so yes. I think I agree and totally own and acknowledge I was did not get this done as soon as I wanted but I think we can I'm extending it in the next week or two okay yeah. or as soon as we can but yeah. on the uh, on the back end side uh, they were really hoping to have everything today so that we get it printed and folded and in the mail by uh, Thursday, uh, those Friday is a federal holiday. Mm -hmm. Most of us will be open. Um, at this point, I don't think it's likely that it's going to get in the mail this week. Uh, so right. I'd say it's beginning of next week. Is, is much more so fun. if we got it to them by end of day Wednesday, we could think about a Monday, Tuesday. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, this, they, they'll work as fast as they can yeah. and get in the uh, mail next week. The one issue consideration I had. Uh, when the, the survey is it talks about the quarry, mm -hmm. most people are in the know what that means. Mm -hmm. So, how can we reword? Yeah, mm -hmm. so about my draft email, I wrote sustainable long term source of aggregate for the community. But, Chris, you check me on my wording. <laughs> Because to me, that's the outcome, right? Like that's one potential tactic. And I don't know that there's anything else on the table, but the problem we're trying to solve is figuring out a sustainable- Can you help? So what would you call that? Like verse, instead of quarry as a bucket, sustainable or long-term plan for, or? And while we all know maybe, what aggregate is in here? I would I would say you know gravel products as opposed to for the roads. Mm -hmm. Gravel, sand, stone. 
Yeah. Aggregate is the right term, but a lot of people aren't going to know what that means. So sustainable source. Uh, I would just say gravel. I mean, that's the yeah. gravel for road. I would say town operated aggregate resource for in the road market. maintenance, something along that line. That well, are we can use the word aggregate. Yeah, people don't know what that means. Concept things. We can just say town operated gravel. I'm the soldier's collection of gravel. Oh, I know. Yeah, something. Oh. <laughs> Town, town operated travel trip. So I think um, oh, that I, that would go in the bucket. So if if the bucket, so to speak, is a sustainable source of gravel for roads, then in that bucket are subcategories such as collaborative purchasing mm -hmm. between towns, um, a town or a town operated gravel pit. And I guess so. This was my more meta question, Danny, and I'm just acknowledging I'm saying this to you out loud right now. But mm -hmm. we had, I saw like it was a prioritization of buckets, mm -hmm. and then the items within each bucket. Mm -hmm. And I guess I just wasn't sure. Like, do we want community input on if it should be town owned or not? I mean, maybe folks. Yeah, not so it would be. So they would. So they would vote in those subcategories. Right. Like, I recognize that. I'm asking right. what I'm trying to think of what I, as a select board member, would do with that information. So speaking only for myself, my thought is I would like to know, does the community really want to go gung-ho on rec, really want to go gung-ho on conservation? Mm -hmm. And I recognize for some of the buckets, there are real prioritizations. Rec being a good example, we mm have, -hmm. are you really into the pool? Are you really into trails? I, to me, Danny, I can pop a pulse on that. I just wanted to say for some of them, I wasn't quite sure what the, for more operational ones, mm -hmm. like maybe roads, just personally, I don't know that I particularly think that public opinion on who the operator should be is valuable. I think if we think the public says, yes, invest in roads or yes, find a sustainable source, that's really interesting to me in that case. I'm less interested in the specific details. So I totally understood and appreciated why you did those breakouts for some of them. And I guess for other ones, I was like. So maybe those can just be, they can write in like, there because there was one where I didn't even have subcategories. It was like housing, which is way too big. So it's just, I want to know, but we could let it be a short answer with four lines and they could write their so input. You're, you're saying get rid of the gravel pit reference entirely and just put invested funds in roads? Uh, no, the bucket would be versus there. Roads, but town operated versus not versus a contract to me, like that's the execution versus the priority if the public mm -hmm. is so interested. Um, is, no, that's how I'm thinking about how we use the survey, but okay. um, is there other? So we have, yeah, so the yeah, first choice, second choice of buckets. So like for housing and the gravel sourcing, those can just have a header that says housing bucket input. Please write any input you have regarding housing priorities. Please put any input you have. Like if we don't have specific input to solicit in those buckets, then I agree. And I'm reframing now, and maybe a better thing is you have please rank the bucket subcategories. I would just say, please rank maybe the following initiatives from not at all important to very important. It's like to me, the relative ranking of like, I can remember think it's one, two, and three versus I think the pool is really important. And I think baseball fields are not at all important. Weird example, but here we are. Um, do you know what I'm saying? No, I don't. Okay. So you, you don't think it's important for them to rank them, or you think you just want them to check their most important one? I'm more interested in relative ranking than absolute after having just done that annoying Excel thing where you went what, through 11 and it was really annoying. Instead of set, setting up revolving investments, first choice, second choice, very interested, somewhat interested, not at all interested. Or mm -hmm. very oh, 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 just the word. Okay. Yeah, so they don't have to rank the them. They just perfect. identify them. Oh, well, okay. Sorry. That, this, that's yeah, yeah. Okay, so Thank like, you. Yeah. There's an improvement. It has first choice, second choice, third choice, first choice. Yeah, I'm that's just, just the default. Thinking of like verbiage. No interest, some interest, a lot yeah. of interest. Yeah. Well, then, so what I would say, because they're all like some have five and some have two, it would be one to five, one being most interested, five being least interested. 
Because. Because you want to force them to. No, because them. some will have two. Well, I mean, I guess we could just word it differently on every one. Because if one has two, it's very interested, not very interested. And that might not be the case. They might be really interested in both, but one is more important to them. Oh, Maybe you want that question for every time. single one. Sorry, yeah, um, not, I was just, I, uh, I was just, yeah, okay. Yeah, like to me, how many you want that for every single over hair slash improvements fit as opposed to third? I'm just thinking of my data brain and what I would do with that data versus seventy percent of people rated pool improvements as a very high priority use of ARPA funds. Okay, I'd have to figure out how to do that, but I think we can do. That. I and I'm happy, like I said, I am acknowledging I have ready to know this feedback, and I'm happy to work with you tomorrow after we volunteer at the polls. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that'll take a little time, but I think we can get there. Okay. And did we get to the school question? Oh. We got Bell's response. So, did you see my response? I didn't. Oh, I didn't oh know yeah. So, so I'm a little concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what the impetus of the question is, but mm -hmm. all of our children in all of the schools that we have are union schools. So are we gonna be spending Waterbury of money? Uh, I mean, I, yeah. I it should be a school to go there. Right. Because <laughs> it's not just the town of Waterbury. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what we pay school taxes for. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I would agree. I think it's just too hard to untangle. I, that regardless of, I had to reread the email because at first I thought it was like, are we asking about a school bond? And then I was really confused about why we're conflating it on the survey. But mm -hmm. I have to say, I think either way, I mean, Bill makes this point ad nauseum frequently that like when people complain about taxes, they look at the portion of that that's municipal taxes and that we steward that really responsibly, you know, shooting mm -hmm. to the schools. But um, I think it introduces a weird complication. When it yeah. Where it came from was just uh, I talked to a couple of people saying that they were talking about priorities for ARPA funding, and a couple of two different people were asking, mm -hmm. well, why wouldn't you consider the school? It's, you know, it's sort of top of mind mm -hmm. because the school bond vote uh, just went down to defeat, and, uh, and I can't. So, <laughs> are we going to get money for that? Awesome. Right. Well, we, we, we can. We, we did, right? Biden's paying off everybody's tuition, so put in a request for <laughs> pool funding. Great. Or talk to the state of Vermont, who may or may not have all sorts of. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just acknowledging we got local ARPA funding. The state got a ton of funding, and VLCT just came up with a guide to all of the new state programs um, funded by ARPA funding. The Ooh. state used a fair amount of one time ARPA funding to buy down the ed tax rate this past year by about 15 cents spent on each three village towns. So, mm -hmm. As I understand it, um, from folks I've talked to, there's no money to do that this coming year. So there's a likely 15%, sorry, 15 cent yeah. ed tax increase uh, before you do your budget. Before, you, before budgeting you as a one time deal. Yeah. 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 Yes. 15 cents, was that the amount? Doesn't matter. Matter. Doesn't matter. Matter. We keep electing the various one. Yeah. All right. Okay. So um, our my just how they spend some of the rest. proposition then is that we, that Alyssa and I work together to revise the drafts that we have and redistribute what will hopefully be the draft of what we'll actually send out. So that'll be much easier to give feedback and then we'll go from there. Okay. Our goal will be to have this complete by the end of day Wednesday, but I, I you know, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm just throwing this out there. Is there a way of simplifying it? I think that's what you're looking at probably doing. Trying to do, yeah, and, and maybe more so encouraging people to fill out a simple, simple survey and then get their butts to the public meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, they've got other concerns. You might want to throw the caveat in there that we only have one place to go about. Sorry. Did you read Wait. the first slide? <laughs> <laughs> That's from Chris and revisions are welcome. <laughs> okay, that is the plan. Like Paying for a ton by mail, I like this. Yeah. 
Yeah. I appreciate what you're doing, and I just hate to see you taking up all your time. Yeah, so, I'm trying to avoid getting in the weeds, but also make it meaningful because if it's not giving us information, I mean, I know it's twofold. One, we want some data, but also we want that public facing saying, like, you know, we're trying, we're trying to have this conversation or start the conversation, but I also want it to be helpful data. So we want it simplified, but also useful. Right. So you don't want to turn people off from looking at a complicated list of right. questions. And I don't know if there's a fine line there between. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'll fill this out short and sweet. Right. Front and back, maybe. Right. right. Here's the fun side. Here's the scary side. <laughs> We're gonna work. Uh, yeah, we do. We're gonna do it every Sunday. Let's... We are moving on to managers' items, status report, town debt obligation. All right. So this was yeah. one of the things I needed to bring Tom up to speed on, and yeah. since a couple of you haven't yeah. been through a budget process, um, this is updated. Uh, we didn't issue any debt in 2022. So um, it's fairly straightforward. If you start at the top left, you see there 8.97%. Uh, That's the percentage of debt that we owe to us as opposed to banks. Uh, a few years ago, that percentage was much higher to us, like 17 or 18%. But in 2020, we issued um, $1.36 million of debt and the bank gave us that money or lent us that money. So the, the ratio changed significantly. Um, that was for the fire trucks. And the, yeah, fire trucks, exactly. the roadside mower, all that stuff, yeah. And basic question, not being borrowed from the tax stabilization fund. That money that we owe ourselves. Yeah, you can see it right yeah. there at the, just in the, the left paper. column. The tax stabilization fund. So um, it's pretty simple. Um, we issued, you can see the, the amount that was issued there on the third column over from the left. Uh, you can see the balance today of those things. So the paving bond, which we issued in 2015, uh, we paid half of it. Um, and that was, we paid half of it through the end of last year. Uh, and we'll pay down another fifty thousand dollars this year. Um, in fact, we, we already have, but uh, the, the balance there in green was going into into this year. Um, you can see the number of years each each uh, obligation was. Um, some of them look odd, like when you see eleven years or twenty one years or twenty two years. Uh, when we voted the bonds for the municipal building, uh, we voted the bonds in 2014. Uh, we owed a first interest payment late that year. So we got the money early in the year. We had to pay a first interest payment, six months worth of interest mm -hmm. in the fall that year. Uh, and then we actually asked for a deferment of one year. So we paid in 2014 and 2015, we only paid interest. And then 2016 was the first year that we actually paid principal. So it was a 20 year bond, but we, we deferred um, the, the payment schedule for a couple of years. Um, the next column is the interest rate. If you look down at the, the ones that we borrowed from the tax stabilization funds, the bottom five, and you can see there the interest rate says variable uh, 2.75. So when we issued to ourselves uh, a loan from the tax stabilization fund to the infrastructure CIP back in 2014, we decided to pay ourselves 4%. And at that time, we, we did that because um, it was a way that we could put a fixed income component into our own uh, tax stabilization fund. It was going back there. We, when the tax stabilization fund was first created, we probably had 40% of the tax stabilization fund investments were in fixed income, um, corporate bonds, uh, things like that, um, uh, mortgage backed securities and the like. And they were paying 
you know, four or five. I mean, we've still got a couple of bonds that are paying over seven percent that we bought. <laughs> They're about to mature next mm -hmm. next year. Um, but when we couldn't get that anymore, we shifted a lot of our investments away from bonds and we bought balanced mutual funds that paid good dividends. But then when we started to have these needs of our own, um, we had money, wasn't in our checking account, or over here in the Edward Jones account, and said, well, instead of borrowing $250,000 from the People's United Bank, let's borrow it from ourselves. And we paid ourselves 4%. And that was kind of buoying the uh, fixed income portfolio of the tax stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. um, the last couple of years, uh, you know, we, we've got to raise that money even to pay ourselves through taxes. Uh, and the interest rates kept going down, down, down. So we said, well, 2.75 is still more than we would be um, able to borrow. I mean, a, a better rate than we would be able to borrow from the bank. So we lowered the rate. So on those, in 2022, if you just look at that top one, uh, the infrastructure things that we did from the tax stabilization fund, we owed, uh, we still owe 37,500 on it. In 2022, we're paying principal and interest to ourselves at $13,531. That's at 2.75%. The rest of the columns to the right, I bumped it back up to 4%. I don't know if that's what we'll charge ourselves next year, but I bumped it up. And that's why the 20, 2023 column for those five loans to ourselves are either the same, you know, their level of principal and interest, and some of them go up, but we'd have to pay ourselves more. So we'll we'll figure that out during the budget process. But at the bottom, under that big solid line. Those are the total interest and in principal payments that we're making to the banks and to ourselves for all of these loans. And then there's the annual change. And you see from 2022 to 2023, next year, um, there'll be an $8,000 savings over what we're paying now. The year after that, it will drop another $14,500. The year after that, in 2025, it will drop off by $33,351, assuming we don't add anything like that. Mm -hmm. So the tax rate necessary to pay this interest in principle, you can see right there in 2022 was 9.6 cents of our tax rate went to pay debt service. I didn't segregate it. You can quickly do it if you wanted to. Um, we don't have to charge ourselves any more interest than what we get on the float in the bank. So if, if the cash in the bank is getting 0.25%, we could pay the tax stabilization fund back 0.25% and comply with the law, you know, it's fund accounting that money belongs in that fund. You can't, you shouldn't lend it for nothing, but Again, we're trying to set money aside, so we charge ourselves higher interest. But you see that tax rate will continue to go down, especially when we get out in the years 26, 27, 28. It's, it's dropping by you know, three, four percent, and three or four cents then. That's assuming an increase grand list of uh, half a percent per year. So if we get more than a half a percent of a grand list increase, uh, the tax rate of the year would go down. And you can see those red X's, those are the years in which that particular loan goes away. So I don't want to belabor the point. Um, you know, it's uh, we're paying about 20 ish percent. Our tax rate is 50 something cents, 53, 55, whatever it is. It's a number. But, you know, nine cents of 50, so round it off 10 cents. Um, we're paying uh, that in, in uh, the, the percentage in debt service of our tax rate is in debt service. 
And again, a uh, considerable amount of that is being paid to ourselves. It's not, you know, it's into fun. Technology. So, um, so anyway, that's, if you have questions, uh, you can ask them now. Um, it's an exercise they did mainly for Tom, but since I was doing it for him, I figured out. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it's helpful. Okay. Questions? Is it likely that we will take on more debt to purchase more vehicles going forward? That sort of thing? Um, it's hard to say, Roger. I mean, we're going to talk about the CIP in a second, and it's just going to be a, a structure kind of thing. Uh, we do have needs coming down the pipe. Um, the, the investment portfolios have taken a bit of a beating this year, so there's yeah. not as much in the investment portfolios as there once were. But I was very pleased the other day when you know, I... I gave Tom all the Edward Jones portfolios and said, review them, and here's the balance sheets for the funds. And, uh, you know, Tom said, boy, it's nice to be part of an organization that has some resources. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're much better off than many communities, our size in particular, and even more so than some that are, that are bigger than us. So, are we going to have to borrow? You know, my philosophy, and I know it is at odds with the philosophy of some people who are here tonight, and they can speak for themselves. But you know, you're not going to be able to borrow at 1.55 percent like you did mm -hmm. on that uh, 266,000 dollar line, mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to borrow 1.1 dollars at the 2% that we did a few years ago. But whatever we can borrow at is going to be much less than you could borrow at, even if you had the same amount of capital in the bank and the same credit rating and everything else, because the interest that banks earn from municipalities is not taxable to them, you know, to pay income tax on it. So we get lower rates. And when we buy a fire truck that costs $750,000 or $950,000 or $450,000, whatever it was, and it has a 20 year life, you're a lot better off to borrow the money at below market interest rates mm -hmm. and pay it off over time. Um, and we've chosen to borrow some of this from ourselves. And I think that's a good idea if you've got those resources that are available, and especially if they're outside of your, you know, the, the caps that you're operating. We, we've got it in a separate yeah. institution. It's not part of our day-to-day -day operation. So if we borrow from the tax stabilization fund um, and pay ourselves back, we kind of get the both of best of both worlds. We're not using our operating capital or our taxes to pay for everything right up front and we're getting um, decent interest rates. Um, so yeah, over time, you, you know, if you pay 20 years of interest on something, um, you know, you're gonna pay more in the end than if you just paid your $500,000 out front today. But the dollars 15 and 20 years from now are worth much less than they're going to be than they're worth today, especially if inflation stays at eight <laughs> percent. So I, I think that you know uh, public finance is different. I mean, at home, if I have extra money, throw it against my mortgage to try to pay my mortgage off quicker and get rid of my debt because I have a finite lifespan and my kids have a finite lifespan. But here, the municipality is going to be here forever, mm -hmm. and, and people are going to need fire trucks and bridges and everything else, and they should be paid for over the life of their yeah. their um, use, or yeah, the lifetime of, of of their use by everybody who uses them. So, I think that we have kept our debt reasonably manageable. Um, do we like to have less? Absolutely. Every year in the budget time, you like to say, oh, gee whiz, in 2026, it's all going to be seven and a half percent. I mean, seven and a half cents as opposed to 
nine and a half cents. That's good in that budget year, but doesn't mean we shouldn't we shouldn't borrow. And and again, one last thing is you know even with the money that we're sending to the uh, from the tax stabilization fund to the general fund. We've got $50,000 budgeted this year. We made a decision a few years ago at town meeting that we could use up to 5% of the year end value of the tax stabilization fund to send to the general fund. It's valued at about a million dollars. 5% is $50,000, so that can go. But the market is down right now. Mm -hmm. But we've got one point. $5 million worth of ARPA money still mm -hmm. sitting in the bank, or, you know, I haven't moved the money out of there to, to you know, even though we paid the ICE Center. So on the budget report, I'm going to show that there's a $50,000 transfer from the tax stabilization fund to the general fund. But I'm not going to sell uh, security that might be down. 25% this year from what it was at the beginning of the year to raise that $50,000. It's just going to mm -hmm. show up on the balance sheet as a due from the tax stabilization fund to the general fund. So managing your money, uh, taking advantage and being able to use your assets without actually spending them is what we try to do all the time. So, yeah. And, okay. and we'll talk more about that budget so i fear our i fear our ability to keep pace with the uh escalating increases of vehicles highway vehicles for instance um i think i told you about the cost of the triads and that yeah it's huge, it's huge. Went from one hundred eighty thousand dollars to two hundred and fifty thousand yeah, dollars. You know, know right? and, yeah. And you, you probably if, if you can get it, if you can get it, that's the other thing. You know, um, so you know we're vulnerable to a pretty quick impact and, and or decline in our ability to uh, keep on top of our rolling vehicle maintenance program mm -hmm. uh, amongst other things you know if, if things don't take a turn here yeah there's uh, mm -hmm. those challenges they're absolutely there right now when i told you a couple meetings ago i'm you know the trucks that we've ordered a year ago and they're still not here they're still not on the road for us i mean what are we going to do of course you know i've been we're trying to put pressure to change the way things happen at the highway department when it comes to excessive sanding, excessive salting. Now we're faced with a fuel issue on top of all that. It seems more imperative than ever to consider looking at that, uh, at least during the short term, until if and until fuel prices can start to go the other way. Um, have you heard anything about, are we, as much as I hate to say it, are we locked in for our salt season? Uh, from what I'm understanding, there's only salt. one supplier. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and there's no lock in that. Yeah, right. so, and, and we don't have sport. sport. Which, and, you know, for me, it's like, great. I'm, I'm glad to see some pressure start to be put there so that it maybe forces us to start to curb. Yeah. Uh, usage. Uh, so I'm wondering if the highway department's been informed about that. If no, they know. Things that are being done to start to try to get them curbed. Okay. All right. So any other questions on the debt stuff right now? No, thank you. <laughs> so Mike Dilbar, the guy that I hired from DLCT to help with some of the audit stuff that I was getting frustrated with. So one of the things that we have, um, we have to keep a, a list of all of our capital assets. And this isn't, isn't that list, but we have to keep a list of all our capital assets, including you know the value of Main Street out there. And we have to 
straight line depreciated every year. And it's crazy because we can't sell the road. We can't, you know, we can't use. We don't pay taxes. We can't write the it off. Road, you know, we can't borrow against the value of the road. But we have to. We have to say that it's worth twenty-one million dollars. And this year, you know, I think we're deciding it has like a forty-year life. And you know, auditors just changed the life uh, expectancy of buildings on our audit this last year. They bumped it from. 40 years to 75. So don't ask me why, but big difference. Was really good. All of our rooms. All of them. So anyway, um Great. from a depreciation perspective. Yeah. 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 So it's less depreciation than we yeah, but is it really going to last 75 years? Plus, <laughs> <laughs> we put that 150,000 from the airplane. Nah. Okay. So, <laughs> anyway, um, this is uh, I, I photocopied the 1999 uh, annual town report. And you said you didn't bring your town report. Mm -hmm. This is what the this is what the CIP used to look like. Okay, uh -huh. so one fund, it was fund 30, it was one fund, and all of the highway equipment that we felt was capital was listed. We had the replacement values there. Uh, the administrative was some debt, and then the car that I used to drive was considered an, an administrative uh, department asset. The fire department, trucks, recreation department. This is what it used to look like, and you could see there that in 1997, the replacement value of all the things that we cared to list was $1.4 million. And then the next column, we showed that we were going to buy a dump truck for $87,000, a one-ton truck for $39,800, and some office equipment for $8,500. And then we were going to do $19,620 worth of field improvements on one of the rec fields. And that was going to there'd be $152,700 spent. Then you should see the grand list at the time, 2.493 million. And then the beginning balance of the capital fund in 1999 was $255,000. And we had made a decision back in those days that we were gonna put four cents of our tax rate into the capital fund. So four cents times that grand list generated just short of $100,000 of revenue. And then we had some of this money, some of that $255,000 was being invested. And you see that there were uh, there was an expectation of uh, interest earnings. And then there was the purchases. And if 1999 worked exactly like we thought it would, we would have $213,000 at the end of of the, um, the year. And if you look at the next column, the dump truck cost a little more. We didn't buy the one ton truck, uh, spent $8,200 for office equipment, only spent $4,600 on field yeah. improvements. So we spent $147,000. Uh, we earned $13,000 of interest, but we had a $27,000 uh, loss in the investments. So at the end of the year, the fund value was um, 236,692. This is how it was structured. This is how it was looked. Um, at risk that she might watch this, Rebecca, <laughs> Rebecca Ellis didn't like this. She didn't like the fact that we had it all on one in one fund. And in one year, I was telling Tom this afternoon, and I forget what year it was, but we were doing something on Stowe Street or Union Street, uh, upgrading the, the road, and Pilgrim Park was starting to really uh, build out. And if you remember, the entrance to Pilgrim Park from Railroad Street, you get by the Eldridge Mill and you pitch down the road, and it was a gravel road. It was gravel down there, down. It was, there was no drainage, and mm -hmm. the road was all washed boards. So I went to the select board. I said, we've got this crew here. We've got these materials here. Let's do the road. It wasn't in the budget. And let's just do the road. And 
um, the select board. It was a little controversial, but the board decided to do it. And I can't remember if Rebecca was on that board or if she came on a year or so after that, but she didn't like that and advocated for splitting our capital fund into what we now know as Fund 70 is paving, Fund 71 is infrastructure, Fund 72 is, is uh, highway vehicles, 73 is fire vehicles, 74 is fire. Not your Whatever, and then <laughs> recreation in the seven plots, right? So it's all split, but we don't do anything really differently than we did here because she was trying to advocate that we should put enough money into each of those funds to keep all of their fund balances above water. And if you look at your um, report, when you have it with you next, if you look at the fund balances in all of those 70 to 75 funds, the fire one might have, you know, $700,000 in it, and the recreation one might be underwater, and the town infrastructure one might be negative $190,000. And at the end of the page, in the last page after 175, I say the consolidated balance is this. It does what essentially you, this. Is this. Yes. And if you tried to keep all of those funds above water, you'd have to raise way more taxes than four cents or whatever it is that we're raising today. So I would advocate, let's go back to this. Now it will make next year's town report look a little funky because I'm gonna to have to show that fund 70 had whatever, $500,000 budgeted and we spent $407,000, but the proposed fund 70 spending in 2023 will be zero because we're not going to have them. We're going to go back to this. So you can think about it. I'm going to start working to update this. But Gilbar, the guy who I hired to try to satisfy the auditors when I showed him what we have for the capital fund right now, fund 70 to 75, he said, that's not a capital budget. That's, I don't know what that is. And I showed him this and I said, well, and he said, yeah, that's the capital budget. So I asked Tom about it. And it's a capital budget written by the auditors in Minutia. And this shows us everything I think we need to see. Um, and go ahead. No, go ahead. And I, I agree with Bill. I don't think there's uh, logic or value added in showing it in, you know, five separate Seven buckets um, and managing those buckets to the bottom line of all of that makes perfect sense. And you don't need, um, as long as you're, you know, if you've got that planned fire truck that's three quarter million dollars purchased in three years, as long as you've got the cash in three years, you can be negative in one year in that fund. It doesn't matter. Right. Um, so I think that's what we're trying to execute. This, this list of items on this capital improvement plan shouldn't change unless we, for some reason, decide we need something that is that's out of the ordinary, right? I mean, right. the first thing, the first thing that they ask us, the first thing that they ask us is, what do you define as? And Tom and I have been talking about that a little bit, talking with Mike about it. Right now, it says any single item that we buy that's $5,000 or more is considered mm -hmm. capital. Tom thinks that's a little low. Mm -hmm. um, probably, especially with 8% inflation, I might agree with them. So when we buy a dump truck, a, a, a truck for the highway department, whether it's a tandem or uh, just a regular the small, what are they? Well, six wheel trucks. So, uh, yeah. no, they're not. The standards are the six wheel right? truck. Truck is okay. Yeah, I like the the yeah. Have 10 wheels. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> small <laughs> truck. Am I, six. Am I six right? wheels. Small. So, when we buy a truck, and I just say it was like, I was like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I know, way too detailed. And, uh, <laughs> we are nearing 10 o'clock. I'll be well, we just, soon enough. It's like, let me go move on. Anyway, when we buy a truck, and let's say the truck costs uh, $150,000 to buy the cabin chassis. And then it's another $40,000 to buy the plow and 
the body and the sander. We put it all together and the truck is $210,000 or whatever the price is. But once in a while, something happens and you keep the truck longer, but the sander bites the dust and you have to buy a new sander. So now are we buying a sander for you know $15,000 and that's a capital thing, or are we just fixing the truck? So mm -hmm. those are mm -hmm. details that we have to figure out on, on this end. And will Mike help you with that? Yeah, Mike, yeah. Mike has already helped by saying what I had done before is really what should have been done. And to your point, yes, the list won't change very often. And, you know, it might say, you know, 1996 loader replaced in 15 years. So, you know, when 15 years gets here, the list will change and it will say, you know, 2008 loader or whatever 15 years from 1996 is. No, I meant the list of accumulated items like the track. Right. The, 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 yeah. yeah. How many trucks we we'll, have? We'll, the idea is they're going to be replaced. So the number right. of items right. that we have is going to be minimal. Yeah. And the thing, the, the place where the most chance for expansion of the list is, is the recreation mm -hmm. plant, you know, the tennis boards, the fields, the buildings, that, that's kind of uh, part of some. Alyssa, you have a question, I think. Well, this is so. So, why my brain is still exploding over depreciating Main Street, but I'm going to get over it because it just it keeps on playing hysterical. So, with that premise that I have no financial background or expertise, it deferred to the two of you and the person we paid to do this. As a layperson, when I think about my budget in an Excel spreadsheet, there is something I'm remembering when Gary came to talk about the CC Fisher Fund, and you said, even if you're paying for this training out of donations. I think you should run it through the town because we want to know what the right. cost of running a good fire fund is. So my assumption is that you can still, am I correct that this is some minutia about how you put things in funds that doesn't make you too happy? And I don't mean that to be like demeaningly, but to me, knowing those, some of those things departmentally might have at least to a lay person a useful effect, or is that just a divide between me as a, like, it's again, not a list. But I think if you, you know, we can, there's a, there's a page in the town report that's called CIP snapshot. I think we can still put in that snapshot that infrastructure, we're going to do this bridge, this culvert, and, and town vehicles, we're going to buy this truck. So we can have that in the CIP snapshot and still, but you can, you can see it all right here. You can look at this and say, okay, in 1999, we're going to buy that dump truck, and, and and then we're going to buy that dump truck, that same dump truck. We're going to buy it in two thousand two because it has a six year life or whatever life it is. It's all right there. I, I understand the table. I guess I'm just saying in the same way, like you gave us this table and said this isn't broken out by department. So I don't know how much of our debt service is paying for. It's because we did a new building and it took a ridiculous bond, and so you know five cents of the nine cents we're paying is actually for this. I, again, I'm not going to argue okay, against it. I, I know it's all this. So, my question is, was, is there... Uh, I guess I missed you. I, my question is, as a lay person, yeah. seeing some of those more frequently in categories is useful. You clearly are telling me the others are telling us not to do that. So I will defer to your expertise. I'm just saying, as a person who's looking at this for the first time, the reason the, the Rebecca Ellis Fund 70 fire and rec is different is because maybe there's, it's just interesting. They're like, hi, we have a million dollars in rec assets and nothing in trucks in the CIP plan. I frankly think breaking it out is more confusing because if you look at it, if you take the time to look at it, I would think people would raise their hand and say, why is the infrastructure CIP fund balance, you know, negative $250,000? Now you have to explain to them, well, because, you know, we don't put enough money in it to keep it above water every year because we've got all That's kinds right of other now. issues. You have it all right on one page. And the transfer is always collected, that and, four cents or seven. So right now we have, so, from our general fund, from the fire department budget, and from the rec department budget, there's transfers going to the CIP mm -hmm. funds. And some of it, you know, the rec all goes to fund 75. 
but some of the fire money goes to fund 73 to pay for the vehicle, some of it goes to fund 74. The nice. highway money goes from the highway department to 70, 71, 72. Now it's just you can put on there the amount of taxes going to fund capital expenses is in 1999 was four cents. I don't know what it is now, but you have to do a lot of math and jumping through hoops to figure it out now because we've got it in six different funds as opposed to one fund. But is how much rec contributes proportional to how much rec can then get out, or then uh, that's what I mean. Like, and it, this might just be because I haven't been through a budget cycle, so we don't yeah. need to belabor this anymore. I'll come meet with you. But I, 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 I'm not disputing it on no, the no, I, I'm just saying it. I'm not, I'm not upset at your question. So, there again, how much does rec contribute? Um, maybe you change that part of the budget because we're funding fund 75 and that's recreation only you have to show it's coming from recreation so there's a nexus there right mm -hmm. but you you can take it out of, of an individual department you can just put a line item in your general fund budget that says to capital fund and, and that's the amount of money that you need, whether it comes from rec or fire department or whatever, it doesn't really matter. It's the, it's the municipal versus personal budget. So when I save money, I say, I need a phone in three years, here's 50 bucks a month, here's 600 dollars. That's not for something else. It just, yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, I say, I'm not disputing it. I defer to your financial expertise. We're still gonna see the revenue by department. You'll still see departmental revenues, but you'll, you'll see expenditures from the departments. But we won't see revenue. You'll be too. We don't. I mean, and I think it's a snapshot. I don't like. I don't yeah. think there's action tonight. I'm just yeah. talking through. I'm like, it's bizarrely counterintuitive to me as the person who doesn't do it. But I defer to what all the professionals think we should do. That's all. We can. I mean, we've done it for since like 2000. No, if, if you, Tom, and Mike, <laughs> you are, I'll think we should do it. It makes sense to me. I'm not going to stand here and say no. I'm saying from the, like I said, really lay perspective, I can see why some folks thought it was interesting. Right. And, so, and to further, you know, confound you, the, <laughs> the, the auditors just told me. Now, we've had these audit, Sullivan and Powers has been auditing us since 2017. This is the first time it's been. So, so every year they give us, okay, and Tom's been through it. Auditors just want to make you jump through hoops because they can. <laughs> and, and you spend a lot of time and energy arguing with them. This is why we do this. Well, it'd be better here. So anyway, right now we send money from the fire department fund, or but that's a bad example, the highway. We send money from the highway fund. There's whatever five hundred thousand dollars in the highway budget that says to capital funds. So five hundred thousand dollars goes over there. Some of it goes in the paving fund. Some of it goes in the infrastructure, and some of it goes in the vehicles. Right, but it all adds up to five hundred thousand dollars. Each of those funds, like the paving fund, there's a debt service line that says fifty thousand dollars to pay that paving loan back. We've been doing that forever since Rebecca made us split this up. The auditors have been auditing those funds, 70 to 75, since 2017. This year, they told me, uh, you really shouldn't be paying debt out of your capital funds. Debt should be paid out of your general fund. So it's like, okay, well, we've been doing, we've been sending it over here and paying it so people can see that mm -hmm. we're paving a road, we borrowed money, we put the revenue in there for the borrowed money, which goes up in the CIP as revenue. Now we have to pay that back to the bank, but you're telling us you don't want that line item in the CIP budget, you want it over here in the general fund. So there's things we're going to be changing anyway. So, and it's, as frustrating to me, Melissa, as it is maybe to you, mm -hmm. but that's why we're talking about it now, because we don't want to just spring it on you and say we're making a, a big change. But I think 
this is much more in line with how we have to report our assets, how we have to report depreciation, and how we frankly plan. Because seeing it all on one page is a whole lot easier. It gives you a, a, a universal, a global snapshot, so to speak, right away. And you, you know what you've got to do. Well, so instead of 500000 coming out of the uh, highway department bill towards paving projects, it'll just come out of the general fund to go to the paving. Well, I mean, because this clearly is. You know, you're calling a capital improvement, but basically it's vehicles and there's no paving on this page. Well, that's because we didn't fund paving this capital. That's infrastructure. To me, infrastructure is different than. But we didn't fund paving that way back in 1999. We can put all the paving projects in the capital fund and fund it this way. Is that your plan? Is that what you're thinking? My plan is to move back to something like this. Yeah, we should have everything that we consider to be a capital expense in the capital oh, page, right? Which paving and is paving. now. Paving is a capital, yeah. yes. So mm -hmm. most paving is a capital plan. Now, you know, you get an argument in terms of, well, you know, is an overlay a capital expense? Yeah. 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 Some of it's maintenance, right? But yeah. some of it's maintenance, but if you, well, that if you do a little short stretch, like the $20,000 for, for down there, mm -hmm. maybe that's not really capital. You could just put that in the house highway budget. But if you do a mile of road and, it, and it's, you know, $300,000, well, that's a capital expense. Even though it's really just overlaying something that I would consider that a capital expense. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's good. Great. Is this the same one you have to find from Bill and Dr. Bonia? It's a that he has written yeah. it all. Yeah. I did appreciate it. Oh, I, well, I remember that. Um, Okay, finish it up with a staffing update, sir. Okay, so this is, I, I, I spent uh, the better part of the week before last, Tom was starting on Halloween, which was last Monday, right? Okay. Yeah. So the, um, the week before last, I was worrying quite a bit whether Tom would actually show up here. Oh, no. <laughs> Not because I was fearing Tom, you know, pull the fast one on us, but I was fearing Tom might say, screw that. There's <laughs> such turnover there. So in the past month, he's here. In the past month, EFUD has had two of its two water treatment plant operators <laughs> resign. Uh, fortunately, Bill Woodruff still has a license and we're not violating our permit to stay. <laughs> But two water treatment plant operators resigned. Um, one of them um, resigned and took a job over at Howard Union uh, to be the facilities manager over there. So, and when he resigned, um, then we had also already heard that uh, Brad Roy, who had was the second in command, if you will, um, he just has a, had a baby, so he's been on paternity leave, family leave, I guess we call it now. Um, and we already knew that he was looking for another job. Uh, so to put it in perspective, he was making uh, just short of $25 an hour for that job, which is, I don't know, what's that, 40 50 a year? 45, 48, 50, almost $50,000 a year. And then he had some overtime, a couple hundred hours of overtime on top of that. <laughs> uh, he was offered a job that was going to be uh, $59,000 a year without any overtime, uh, without having to be on call, without having to work on weekends, all of which are required in our job. Um, Offered him a ten dollar an hour raise to stay. Ten dollars an hour. You know, every dollar is two thousand dollars, and so it's a twenty grand raise 
before any overtime. Um, thought about it, but didn't like the fact that he had to work the on call on weekends. And oh, by the way, the new job that he had, he can work from home. Yeah. So he doesn't have to worry about so. child care, even when yeah. his wife goes back to work. So it's harder and harder to compete in the, in the, in this marketplace. Um, and then, so that was the two weeks before Tom was coming. And then on the Thursday before Tom was going to come, Eric Austin, the mechanic in the highway department, said he was leaving on November 11th, Friday, was this Friday, was his last day. And he's going to go to work for Duxbury. And he said, you know, it's, it's more money and I get my own route and I get my own truck. And he said, how much more? Four dollars an hour. And you know he's making about twenty five dollars an hour for us. So four dollars an hour—that's eight grand a year before overtime. And um, this is not just water rated. This is happening. Mm -hmm. I mean, Tom can tell you he knows what's going on. Water treatment operators just in between Randolph and and uh, probably Essex, which is maybe a little further north, up to Morrisville. Uh, over to St. John's Bay. There's like eight positions open. There. Really? Um, we've advertised for that position. We've got three applicants, one of whom has a license. Um, when Karen became town clerk, we advertised for the tax facility yeah. billing clerk. Before COVID, we would have had 15, 20 applicants easy. We, we had four. We had to re advertise. Um, so I don't have any real hard and fast things that I'm going to tell you, but we're trying to be creative to try to figure out how we're going to retain people. And it's it's kind of critical mm -hmm. to try to retain people. And the only thing that we have is money. And, and I think you're going to mm -hmm. see that wages are going to have to go up. And I know that that hits the tax rate uh, more than anything because it's our biggest expense is personnel. Um, but if we don't have them, we can't do what we need to do. And, um, you know, um, we've hashed around between Tom and Woody and myself, you know, do we, you know, if, if, if it was just and I say just, I don't mean to denigrate anybody, but it was just a, uh, one of the highway truck drivers and not the mechanic. Well, maybe we're just saying, well, we'll live with one less. And, you know, when I first came here, we had six and now we have eight and we don't really have any more roads. We've got eight because we're doing a lot more taking care of ball fields and cemeteries, still in Haskins and some highway department, but for more than half the year, he's mowing, mowing lawns. Uh, we've just been told by the cemetery commissioners that the long-term, long-time uh, contractor that's mowed Hope Cemetery has told mm -hmm. us, well, he's retired, he's going to be gone. So we're going to have to fill that void. So there's a lot of shifting uh, sand out there, so to speak, and it's, it's challenging. Um, and some of these positions are absolutely critical. I mean, you can't not have a lot of treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but on the town highway side, you know, if it was if it was Dylan instead of Eric that was going on, hate to lose him, but not that you know, not an emergency. Position. But now we don't have a mechanic, mm -hmm. so we've kicked around should we just try to hire a mechanic and say this guy is going to be the full-time mechanic not have him plow a route doesn't necessarily need a truck so you can save a truck once in a while you've got a mechanic uh if you can find one you're gonna to have to pay somebody for, for that maybe we don't have to send out as much of our work as we do even with eric i mean eric's a pretty good mechanic but 
when it comes to the bigger trucks, the diesels and everything else. And as we kicked it around, it's like, well, you can hire a mechanic, but it's not 1985 anymore. You need all kinds of computer equipment and everything right. else to do the diagnostic work. So um, maybe we don't even bother with trying to hire a mechanic anymore. Do you have a contract with the uh, like a, a more specialized? Uh... We don't have a contract. I mean, mm -hmm. we bring things back to where we buy them, you know, mm -hmm. Clark's yeah, Truck Center, yeah. whatever their name is now. It's, it's not Clark's anymore, right? But, uh, you know, we, we'll bring vehicles back so that mm -hmm. our dump trucks, the better diesel, that's where they take them and go Clark's. if we have a, a challenge. But we've got a diesel one time right now. It's a Ford, I think. And none of the Ford dealers around do any diesel. So we, have, we finally found a diesel mechanic that would at least look at it, you know, just to diagnose it. Tell us, well, if it's, and if he says, well, it would be $5,000 to fix it, we'll fix it. He tells us it'll be $20,000 to fix it. You know, the truck was going to be retired next year anyway. We probably wouldn't do that. So I'm just letting you know. Uh, I feel badly. I, I told Tom when he came, I said, you know, when I announced my retirement last December, I thought we had a financially sound organization. I'm happy that he thinks that we do, uh, but a, a stable, good workforce, uh, you know, that had relatively low turnover. And we've had more turnover this year, I think, probably than we've had in. 15 years combined, and it's it's tough right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you want to say anything, but I think um, I think it's going to be important what we hire the water operators at, because I think um, it might take a you know they're I know they're ESOT, but they're I think they all consider themselves part of the same crew, and so right. we might create some equity issues. Yeah. At the highway department, based on how highly how much we have to pay these people, mm -hmm. um, so that mm -hmm. might dictate what has to happen mm -hmm. yeah. down the chain. And then the obvious piece, I think, is we've got you know Woody essentially teaching the wastewater operators to run the water plant, um, and so maybe there is some sort of compensation that comes with cross licensing. Mm -hmm. I think if you can do both, you're yeah, pretty valuable to us. Unfortunately, you're also very valuable to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. and, and we've done that. I mean, Bruce Polchek, who was the wastewater treatment plant chief operator, he had a water license. And Brad Roy, who just left the walk, he has a wastewater. Mm -hmm. So we've been cross training. But as he said, cross train, we'll pay <laughs> more money. Here's we'll so more jeopardy. Jeopardy. <laughs> We've got more options. So it's this kind of, uh, you know, circular chasing the tail. Yeah, and some of it, I think, time. just depends on, you know, what the individuals want. You know, in, in right. St. Albans, we had a, a really young green crew we needed to keep. And the complaint we had for years was responding to emergencies. So we said to all these young folks, all right, fine. We can buy a brand new cell phone from Verizon for a buck. And we can pay for an unlimited plan for 30 bucks a month. We're going to buy you all cell phones. And the caveat and pay for, them. And pay for them. I mean, you can use them for whatever you want, personal use. Mm -hmm. The caveat is when it goes off at 2 a.m., you have to answer. Mm -hmm. You don't necessarily respond, but you have to acknowledge the call. Mm -hmm. And that resonated because they were all buying new cell phones every other year for 500 bucks and paying 100 bucks a month mm -hmm. for a plan. So that yeah. paid more than paid for itself. So sometimes you've just got to. Yep. brainstorm with them and see, the needs. Uh, see what works best but the theme i heard and i've heard other places where i've worked that i've heard here that's hard to address as you know i don't before working in municipal government i didn't think of a water operator as a stressful job mm -hmm. i thought of water plants as pretty highly automated um i didn't think at all about the down the upstream work in water or the downstream work in wastewater um but a theme I've heard a lot is, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, it might not be stressful, but if you make a mistake, <laughs> it's a big deal for a lot of people. And, mm -hmm. and all these jobs require, uh, well, the water jobs require someone there seven days a week. And I, job too. Mm -hmm. 
and I, and I get it that we've got to pay you. No one wants to work seven days a week. No one wants to be on call all the time. So it's just part of the challenge. And it's a changing landscape because it's it's no different. When I came here in 1988, we had to. Somebody had to go to the water plant every day. Somebody had to go to the wastewater plant every day. But if it snowed, you had to show up and go plow. It was a different time. People just said, well, that's the job. Uh, and, you know, Mike Grace <laughs> and Bill Woodruff. And, uh, and, and state full of farmers. And, and, yeah. and you know, they were, just, they were here. They worked it out. Oh, I'm going to Boston to a Red Sox game. Okay, I'll be around. I'll take care of it. But now you're getting people, and and it's not a bad thing. It's just a different thing. Where, well, you know, if you want me to be available to to respond seven days a week, you know, before you resign, uh, and where I thought it was going, you know, Brad Roy and Scott wrote. Uh, a three-page memo that says this is what we ought to pay for on call. What we do and have done forever is you go in on the weekend, um, you have to show up, you got to make sure that everything's working, you take a few readings. They're typically there for two hours and we pay them. For two. Mm -hmm. And if there's something wrong when they get there and they work seven, we pay them for seven. But that was always enough to say, that, so every week you, they're built in, they're gonna have 44 hours a week. They get 40 hours of straight time, four hours of all mm -hmm. One of them works this weekend, and, you know, Saturday and Sunday, and two different pay weeks, and then next weekend, the other guy does. And, you know, and that was forever, it's been fine. Now it's like, well, if we're gonna do that, we want, we, we want this amount of time for the weekend, that's okay. But, you know, Monday through Friday, we're also on call if something happens. So we want an hour a day just to be on call, which well, it's 20, 25 bucks, but then it's every day. So it's $125 a week that you're going to pay for the on call stuff. And it's just, it's different. And, and they can get it. Mm -hmm. And there's other places paying a lot more. And the reason I offered Brad $35 was not just to try to keep him. It was looking at the BLCT salary survey and what's exploded since the, since the um, pandemic. You know, we never were at the top of the heap in terms of pay, but solidly in the top third. And, you know, we gave a 5% increase this year just about everybody but we're looking at these people applying for the water operators job with not a days of experience and not one hour towards getting a license and having to pay them 31 dollars just to get them to come through the door so brad's got a license he's got four years of experience so it was we'll pay you 35 dollars to stay and it still wasn't so uh we're gonna have to we're probably going to have to make some decisions now just to, mm -hmm. with pay, to try. And it's not in the budget. You know, the line item is looking already because we gave a 5% increase in April as opposed to the 3% or whatever I budgeted. We're already going to be over on those line items probably by five grand. We're going to have to do more. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think we have a choice. Well, I don't personally think we're going to be able to buy ourselves out of this problem. Uh, the whole healthcare thing at the last meeting was part of my frustrated frustration because obviously in this particular case of Eric Austin, it didn't work. Uh, he got his left anyway. Um, you know, my son claims that $30 an hour is a new minimum wage. Then um, close. Then go to McDonald's and put hamburgers for $17 an hour. If you want to pay rent, you have to, or else you don't have anywhere to live. I, I just, I quite honestly can't figure it out. Um, you know, I'll say this and may not appeal to 
new view, but it seems like we're instead of a country of opportunity, we're becoming a country of opportunists. Uh, work less and <clears throat> get a hell of a lot more. Uh, I've never been under, under that philosophy or mentality of I want all I I want all I want in life on 40 hours a week. Uh, I don't remember when I worked 40 hours a week. And it's also really important to remember that there are a lot of types of people in the world with lots of priorities. And it's important to have folks like you who are fully passionate and dedicated to their work and are able to do that. And it's also important to remember that work and just surviving to pay bills is not some people's priorities. And it doesn't make anyone right or wrong but because I don't want to work more than 40 hours a week just to survive doesn't make me less of a hard worker, more dedicated. I'm saying me just because I'm representing myself, but right. the types of people who don't feel like 50 to 60 hours of their waking week should be dedicated to earning income doesn't make them not hardworking, not passionate, not dedicated or good citizens. Um, it means that they have other things they want to do like Volunteer, serve on boards, raise children, travel the world, and those are all really valid. And so, Bill, I think I want to be clear that you weren't not saying this, but um, just because people don't people don't want to work on weekends doesn't make them lazy. No, no, um, I, 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 I clearly said, said you were not saying that. I just want to say it out loud. That, that Absolutely, there's been a yep. just a shifting of yeah. It's not the word work ethic isn't the right word. It's the only one that comes to mind. It's it's a shifting. And, it's a life work and, and balance and integration. Life work balance. And Brad Roy, you know, he sat in my office and he told me, he said, look, he said, I've been working for water between the sewer and the water for almost five years now. He said, and he worked for, you know, UBM. He, was, he worked in the... Uh, well, lab worker, but he was assigned to a, a boat that did a lot of testing on Lake Champlain. Okay. And he said, when I was in college, he went to UVM. He said, my professors told us as people, he said, what you've done, Bill, you know, 35 years in one place, they tell us you should plan to be three to five years in a job, move on, do different things. So people, a lot of people aren't looking to have one career anymore. Right? They're looking to have varied experiences. And so they're going to say, well, I'll go do that for a while. And then I want to do mm -hmm. something different. Yeah. And, you know, and that puts pressure on those of us who rely on them. And especially when it used to be that um, you could preach to people at employee meetings and say, you know, we're never going to get rich being municipal employees. But it's secure. You're going to get your. Mm -hmm. You're going to get your pay. You're going to get your benefits. You have retirement. Um, so one of the cards we try to play a little bit is, you know, and even with Brad after he left, um, it was like, does the place you're going have a retirement plan? And he said, oh yeah, they, they do. I would never give that up. So it's just mm -hmm. it's just a different world. It's all, yeah. it's all it's different. Different. I mean, we've gone from five days a week. Eight hours a day down to four days a week, ten hours a day. Now, guarantee you, we're getting no more production. Yeah, like it was before. And our cost for that same value is a hell of a lot higher, uh, or it's higher. I'll put it that way. And those are the types of things that frustrate me. Um, and then to turn around and say, I can't afford this, I can't afford that. Uh, you know, don't, don't. <laughs> Well, the challenge, the challenge, Chris, is that that you know we're not, we don't operate in the vacuum. So I resisted the highway department going to the four day week for a long time. Said I, I just don't like the optics of it. That you know something happens on a Friday and we don't have a, a clue. Wrong. I just didn't like how it looked. But when so many other places are doing it. And the, the, the with Brad, the whole work from home that happened during COVID, 
Now, there's experts in the field. If you read articles now, they'll tell you, well, it's the pendulum is going to swing back. You know, there's employers who are saying, oh, you know, we're not going to be doing the work from home like we used to. But VLCT, you know, I mean, they're pretty much becoming a virtual organization. You know, there's hardly anybody in, in the office right there now. And there, there's pros and cons. It's great. I don't know how you, you know, it's harder to measure productivity. I don't think you get the networking and the, the collegiality and all the rest of it. So I don't want to stay here until mm -hmm. you know, but I'm just letting you know yeah. we're facing some challenges and you're going to have to trust us to do what we have to do to try to make sure that we have people to do the jobs that need to be done and we'll keep the focus. And Chris, I know that I we disagree on some of these viewpoints. That said, what I didn't want to do is interrupt you when you were saying that you don't think that necessarily buying our way out of it or how we said it is the solution. If you do have ideas, they're obviously welcome. And whether it's in the meeting or going to see Tom and Bill, um, you know, it's one thing to maybe fundamentally disagree, but if you have constructive or creative you know, ideas to put forth that obviously, I know they're welcome here and I know that they're gonna be welcome in, in the office of the municipal managers. Yeah. So I just wanna make sure and I said that a lot. We're also, you know, I mean, we've got, we're talking about the recreation issues, mm -hmm. you know, we hired Wyatt to be the program manager, Nick was still here, Nick is still working, um, you know, she's still working yeah. for us. Yeah. About 10, 15 hours a week helping Wyatt is, you know, it, it will end at the end of the year, probably. Okay. But he's still doing stuff. And, you know, unfortunately, he and I had our falling out, but he's he's professional. He, he still wants this to succeed. But we, we're in a position now, okay. Um, here we are, we're changing the guard at the manager's level. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Wyatt right now. Is it, should we just kind of put it in neutral? And I've already told Wyatt, when you work with Nick, no new initiatives right now, just do the best that you can do to keep staff in place. Because that's the other thing. Finding lifeguards and, yeah. and, and, and camp counselors, there's a lot of pressure on that wage too. And you know, we're probably going to recommend a little bit of an increase in the in the fees to, to cover mm -hmm. some of those expenses. But there's just a lot of challenges yeah. right now because of the labor market is it's an employees market right now. And maybe with the actions that the Fed are taking to try to force us into a recession will start turning the tide on that a little bit. But in municipalities, I'm not sure how quickly that yeah. will happen. So you have to understand, Danny, that you know I'm 63 or be 63 shortly. I've been self-employed for over 40 years, and I've been on a dead run for over 40 years, and I have the log books to prove it. Um, what frustrates me coming from my, from my perspective is having done all I've done and my and, and I didn't I don't live to work uh, and I understand that people out there that work to live my goal was to and, and it was something that had it in my head from a long time ago that I'd bust my ass while I was young and get to a point in my life where I thought I could retire at a reasonably young age, maybe 63, 64, uh, still young enough to be able and physically able to, to do the things that I wanted to do, knowing that there isn't a lot of time left after that. And what frustrates me now, and I see it not only here in the municipality, but also in my business and everywhere, uh, People don't want to go to the extreme that I did to do, to make myself in a position where I could hope to be comfortable in my retirement years. Instead, they're wanting more to do less. And that's coming from somebody 
like me who has busted their ass all their life and now at, at a point where that ability is waning as you get older and physically less able to do it so you've got a certain amount of reserve that you're counting on and that's starting to get eaten away quicker because you're having to dole more of it out for people who want to do a similar job at a hell of a lot more money uh, well know, it's, i think it's I hope you understand. Yeah, I do understand your perspective. And while I think it's probably better for us to have this conversation, oh, yeah. not in the meeting, I'm going to say this just because people do watch this and it's there. Your perspective is valid and it's your perspective. And I don't want to wait until I'm 70 to do the things I want to do. I want to do them while I'm 37. And that doesn't make me right. And it doesn't make you right. I don't want to do less and get more. I want to live my life fully because as you know, there is no tomorrow that is guaranteed us. And so I want to work very hard and I want to be able to provide an okay life for myself. And I work for nonprofits. I used to be a teacher. I don't plan to be a millionaire, but I, but I and people with similar views as me want to want to work and live simultaneously in a way that's not necessarily the same as you and other people who want to work very hard for a certain period of time. And neither one of us is right. And I just, when I when I disagree verbally with you in these meetings, it's because we are representing and speaking to a large plethora of people with varying worldviews and experiences and priorities. And I want to make sure that we're considering them and their goals when we're having these conversations and making decisions about wages and hiring and housing. It's not because I think you're wrong. It's because I want us all to remember that everyone is different and that's what's really important about our community and to to other people because they have a separate lived experience and different wants for their lives is detrimental to the togetherness of the community that doesn't mean that some people have bad qualities and are greedy and want to be lazy people are but some people are it's human it's human some people that's how it is but i just want to be careful when we publicly categorize people we are othering our constituents, and I just want to be really mindful of that and remember that we have different priorities, but we share a common goal. So how do we get there best? And that's why I say, like, your ideas, while we might have different foundational ideas, you might have really, really good ways of solving a problem that are not the ways that we thought about. So I, I understand you, and I don't think you are wrong. I also just think more perspectives are right than just one. On that note, shall we? Motion to adjourn. So moved. I'll second it. All in favor say good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all. all. Thank you. You should have gone. I don't know. 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 I don't